I now convene the April 18th, 19th, 2024 meeting of the Commission on Teacher Credentialing. The Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act for teleconference meetings require that commission members who are attending the meeting via teleconference to disclose if any other individuals 18 years of age or older are present in the room at the remote location and the general nature of the member's relationship <clears throat> with any such individuals. Are there any disclosures from members attending via Zoom? So I need to call on the members and I can't see them. Uh, Dr. Pavri. No one in the room, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Francois. Good morning, no disclosures, thank you. Is that Cheryl? Commissioner Cotton. No, no disclosures, thank you. And Commissioner Rodriguez. Good morning. No, no disclosures. All right. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Commissioners who are participating via Zoom must be visible at all times on camera. Please log off Zoom if you need to leave the meeting and log in when you are ready to join the meeting. If you experience broadband or internet connectivity problems while participating in the meeting, that would be remedied by joining without video, you must announce the reason for your non-appearance when you turn off your camera. <clears throat> we'll now take roll call. Recording secretary, will you please call the roll? Brown? Here. Catherine Williams Brown? Present. Jose Catinas? Present. Cheryl Cotton? Present. Juan Cruz? Present. Christopher Davis? Present. Michael De La Torre? Present. Anna Marie Francois. Present. Makita Gwino Shire. Present. Megan Gross. Present. Johanna Howick. Present. Susan Aradia. Present. Bonnie Clatt. Present. Ira Litt. Present. Monica Martinez. Here. Shereen Powery. Present. David Simmons. Bong Yudolf. Present. Kimberly Y. Smith. Present. We have a quorum. Commissioner De La Torre, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? With pleasure. Please stand. Place your right hand over your heart. Place the flag. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, in the people with liberty for all. Thank you. I would like to remind everyone about the meeting procedures before we get to today's agenda. <clears throat> this meeting is being conducted at the commission office and via teleconference. We have commissioners participating from the commission building and also via Zoom. The public has the option to attend the general session of the meeting at the commission office or participate remotely through Zoom webcasts or US toll-free phone number. For those participating from the commission office, the microphones must be turned on before you start to speak by pushing the button and then turned off once you're finished. You will know the microphone is on when the indicator light shows green. The microphones for individuals who are attending via teleconference have been muted to eliminate any background noise that may hinder others from hearing what is being said. Commissioners and presenters can unmute yourself, but please mute your microphone after you are done speaking. Commissioners attending the meeting via Zoom that would like to speak, please use the raised hand feature in Zoom. Um, because this is a hybrid meeting, we will need to conduct each vote by roll call. We would like to ask the members of the public who attend the meeting via Zoom and would like to make public comment to check their Zoom identification. Your Zoom identification is the name used when logging into the meeting. It is important that the Zoom identification is accurate so we can call on you appropriately during public comment. Next, we will cover the public comment procedures. The committee chair will announce when the public comment period is open during the presentation of the agenda item and ask for anyone who wishes to comment to notify the meeting moderator. Individuals who attend the meeting at the commission office will need to submit a request to address the commission card to the meeting moderator. The meeting moderator will notify the individuals when it is their turn to speak. 
At that time, the individuals will be able to approach the microphone and share their comment. Individuals who join the meeting via the Zoom webcast will need to click on the raised hand icon to inform the meeting moderator that they would like to speak on the item. The moderator will identify the individual when it's their turn to speak by calling their Zoom ID. At that time, the individual will be pr prompted to unmute their microphone and will be able to share their comment. The Zoom ID name used by the member of the public to join the Zoom meeting will be displayed to the public when the individual provides public comment. Individuals who join the meeting through the U.S. toll-free number will need to press star nine on their phone to inform the meeting moderator that, that they would like to speak on the item. The moderator will notify the individual it is their turn to speak by calling their phone number and will allow them to unmute their telephone. At that time, the individual will be prompted to press star six and will be able to share their comment. Please note only a partial phone number will be displayed to the public when the individual provides public comment. Each of our committee chairs will have the discretion to set a time limit on comments depending upon the volume of speakers seeking to speak on a particular item. For our commission meeting this uh, month, we will limit comments to two minutes each. We ask that you keep your remarks brief and focused on the particular item you are speaking to. Please note this meeting is being recorded. After the meeting, the archived audio and video will be available via the commission's website. Um, I would like to just make a brief announcement that someone in the room is having a birthday today. <laughs> Commissioner Brown um, decided to join us on her birthday, and we're very happy you're here. Congratulations. <laughs> it happens to all of us. <laughs> all right, now we're at a, uh, agenda item 2A. Item 2A is the approval of February minutes. We will now open for public comment. Recording Secretary, are there any public comments? Comment on this item. Thank you. The public comment period for this item is now closed. We will need to make two separate motions to approve the ad hoc committee and regular session minutes. I would like to remind everyone that only those who served on each committee can make and second the motion to improve the committee minutes. Uh, first, do I have a motion from a member of the ad hoc committee to approve the February 2024 ad hoc committee minutes? And again, members of that committee were uh, Commissioner Brown, both Commissioner Browns and Commissioner Martinez. Do I have a motion? Uh, moved by Commissioner Danette Brown. Um, is there a second? <laughs> Commissioner Catherine Brown. Thank you. Any discussion? Will the recording secretary please call for the vote? Aye. Catherine Wynn, wrong. I don't think Monica right. Martinez. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Next, do I have a motion to approve the February 2024 commission meeting minutes? I have a motion by Commissioner Martinez. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, second by Commissioner Davis. Thank you. Will the recording secretary uh, please call for the vote? Each member please respond with aye, nay, or abstain. Danette Brown. Aye. Jose Cardenas. Aye. Cheryl Carlton. Aye. Juan Cruz. Aye. Christopher Davis. Aye. Michael De La Torre. Aye. Makita Gwino Shire. Aye. Megan Gross. Aye. Johanna Howick. Aye. Susan Aradia. Bonnie Clark. Abstain. Ira Litt. Abstain. Monica Martinez. Aye. David Simmons. Fong Yudolf. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Can I change mine to abstain, please? Yes. Thank you. The next item is 2B, approval of the April 2024 agenda. We have agenda inserts for items 2C and 5A. Commissioners, you've heard me say this before. I'd like to start the Educator Prep Preparation Committee no later than 10 a.m., so please keep this in mind during our reports. We will now open for public comment. 
Recording Secretary, are there any public comments? One for this item. Okay. The public comment period for this item is now closed. Do I have a motion to approve the April 2024 agenda? Yes, Commissioner Hartwig. So moved. Do I have a second? Yes, Commissioner Martinez, thank you. I have a second by Commissioner Martinez. Any discussion? Okay. Will the recording secretary call for the vote? And again, each member please respond with aye, nay, or abstain. Aye. Jose Cardenas. Aye. Cheryl Cotton. Aye. Juan Cruz. Aye. Christopher Davis. Aye. Michael De La Torre. Aye. Makita Greeno Shire. Aye. Megan Gross. Aye. Johanna Howick. Aye. Susan Aradia. Bonnie Clark. Aye. Ira Litt. Aye. Monica Martinez. Aye. David Simmons. Fong Yusof. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Agenda item 2C is approval of the April 2024 consent calendar. We will now open for public comment. Recording secretary, are there any public comments? Thank you. The public comment period for this item is now closed. Do commissioners have any items they would like to consider in closed session? Yes, Commissioner Hartwig. Thank you. I would like to pull number 45, Laura Licata, L-I-C-A-T-A. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Clatt. I would like to pull item number 54, Heather Moyer. Yes, Commissioner Gross. I would like to pull number 53, Morrison. Commissioner Davis. All right. I'd like to recuse from number 97, John Klaus. Okay. Yes, Commissioner De La Torre. I would like to recuse from item six, Troy Betts. Item 10, Richard Brabram. Item 22, Charles Donnelly. Item 23, Henry Dubon. Item 29, Gregorio Gonzalez, item 36, Fernando Ibarra, item 43, Ari Langman, item 50, I'm sorry, item 64, Kathleen Salinga, item 75, Brendan White. And I would like to pull item 34, Anthony Hicks. Do you have a motion to approve all remaining items on the consent calendar? Yes, Commissioner Hartwig. So moved. Do I have a second? Yes, Commissioner Brown, thank you. Will the recording secretary please call for the vote? Again, please respond with aye, nay, or abstain. Danette Brown. Aye. Jose Cardenas. Aye. Cheryl Carpen. Aye. Juan Cruz. Aye. Christopher Davis. Aye. Michael De La Torre. Aye. Makita Gwino Shire. Aye. Megan Gross. Aye. Johanna Howick. Aye. Susan Aradia. Bonnie Clark. Aye. Ira Litt. Aye. Monica Martinez. Aye. David Simmons. Aye. Fong Yudolf. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Well, colleagues, happy spring. Signs of the season changing are all around us. Birds seem particularly loud in the morning when I take my dogs out. And my roses, as I was telling Mary this morning, are in full glorious bloom. There is a sense of optimism in the air. I was in our local mountains recently where the snow is melting, resulting um, in hundreds of little rivulets draining into Big Bear Lake. The locals are hopeful that once again, the snowmelt will result in an increased water level in the lake. Last year was up about 11 feet higher than previous years. Another feeling of optimism came about when I was in Chicago for a meeting a couple of weeks ago and had the chance to view the solar eclipse, 94.5% of it. 
And that, that event left me feeling very optimistic. There was something about stepping outside the meeting with scores of others, donning the appropriate safety glasses, and looking up at this, I think for me, is going to be a once-in-a-lifetime once, time, once in a lifetime event. I felt both euphoria and a sense of community. So in spite of the tragedies that are occurring around our world and the political season, which continues to heat up, I try and feel optimistic. But as, as, but, but in, as is often true around this table, our agenda this month is a mix of good news and some sobering news, which leaves me both optimistic and mindful. The teacher residency report in item three, which will be presented by commission staff and our West Ed colleagues, presents lessons learned during implementation of residency pathways over the last several years. Cohort numbers are strong and cohorts continue to be diverse. I am optimistic that state investments in teacher preparation are paying off, and we look forward to continuing to hear the good news about these pathways. The teacher supply report in item 3D is sobering and reflects not only what is happening here in California, but what is happening across the nation. As you've read, the 2022-2023 year marked a decrease of the number of new credentials issued for, issued for the second year in a row, following a steady increase in the prior seven years. There was a decrease in the number of newly issued credentials for all three types of teaching credentials, multiple subjects, single subject, and its specialists. And there was a decrease of teaching intern credentials and waiver documents issued and an increase in teaching permits issued. Such data remind us that we collectively must remain vigilant and continue our efforts to recruit, prepare, and support our future educators. But those of you who know me know my worldview tends toward the glass half full approach. And so let me share some words that I find inspiring. This is an excerpt from an opinion piece written by Randall Balmer that appeared in the LA Times a couple weeks ago. He writes, but what about hope? If faith is a disposition of the spirit and love is a disposition of the heart, hope is a disposition of the will. The workings of both faith and love are to some degree beyond our rational control. Hope, on the other hand, is volitional. We can choose to be hopeful even if faith is elusive and love distant. Right now, making that choice isn't always easy. We can will ourselves to see the glass half full. These days, to hope is both an act of volition and a gesture of defiance. Before I turn it over to Executive Director Sandy, I want to share the results of her recent evaluation with you. Thank you to all who completed the survey. We had a return rate of about 83%, which is pretty darn good, I think. As you know, members of the commission were given a survey consisting of 10 questions to evaluate Dr. Sandy. 15 members of the commission responded. General competencies assessed by the survey included vision, mission, and strategy, achievement of results, people management, program management, the commission and staff relationships, commission meeting management, external liaisons and public image, and other expectations we have for, exec for our executive director. In addition, members were asked to provide Dr. Sandy's three major strengths as a leader and possible areas for the development of skills or knowledge. The first eight competencies were assessed using a scale reflecting extremely satisfied, very satisfied, satisfied, somewhat satisfied, not satisfied, and cannot assess. The final two competencies were assessed using written, uh, ri written comments section. Vice Chair Klatt and I discussed the results with Executive Director uh, Sandy yesterday. We reviewed all the comments with um, Executive Director Sandy, and as always, Mary approached this task with thoughtfulness and care. As she is fond of saying, when you know better, you do better. And that's the spirit with which she has always approached these evaluations. Dr. Sandy's evaluation results reflect a very favorable assessment of her leadership in 2023. The majority of her performance ratings and comments are extremely satisfied and very satisfied. She also received cannot assess ratings. Her greatest strengths include her understanding of vision, mission, and strategy, program management, her relationships with commission and staff, commission meeting management, and other expectations. There were some very uh, notable comments. I won't read them all, but a, a few that um, I think ring true include, 
Dr. Sandy's clarity of mission and purpose keeps the commission responsive to state priorities without being pulled off course by varying special interests. Dr. Sandy keeps her ear on the field, and I would say her heart as well, so that she can effectively advance the mission and strategy of the commission while supporting stakeholders to understand and translate them into real, realistic action for the field. Another uh, commissioner indicated, you could not find anybody more knowledgeable of the commission's responsibilities and therefore it provides appropriate oversight of the work, including the inclusion and engagement of the commission itself, as well as policy leaders and partners. Another comment was uh, Executive Director Sandy has the ability to see issues that are fast approaching and right here and those that are on the horizon will get here sometime. I've been impressed with how she's been able to address unanticipated situations with an approach of both openness to learning as well as essential decisiveness. And finally, Executive Director Sandy's calm and thoughtful responses set a very positive inclusive tone for the commission. Her leadership evokes confidence in staff and commissioners as they carry out the commission's mission and strategy. Executive Director Sandy, on behalf of all of the commissioners, I thank you for your sustained and strong performance this past year. Would you like to make some comments? <laughs> I'd like to head out the back door, but I think we removed it a few years ago. So, uh, so I guess that's not an option. I, commissioners, it is... Um, it is a deep and profound honor for me to serve as the executive director uh, of this agency and to work with all of you. Uh, I've known some commissions in my time. I will have at the end of, this is my 13th year as your executive director. Uh, so we're gonna tip go past the graveyard a little bit. It being year 13 and hope we get to year 14 and all will be well. But uh, at the end of this year, I will have spent 25 years of my professional career working for this commission. I think the only person who remembers and started with me is David Simmons, Commissioner Simmons. That's right. We were talking about that. And it's good to have somebody who remembers the same people, places, dates, issues, um, et cetera. But, um, you know, after 25, <laughs> after 25 years, it does feel like a life's work. Um, and what captured me uh, early on uh, when I was surplused from the Post-Secondary Education Commission before they were eliminated subsequently in statute. So one step ahead of something there. Um, I, I really was not sure what I was gonna find coming to the commission. It was a very small agency, very niche, very technical and focused in its work. And I'd been focused in the much broader policy arena of all of higher education. And I wasn't sure whether this was a good thing or a bad thing, but what I found was my mission and my calling um, and I was at, at that time, uh, I had two young children and had my third young child, a baby when I, in my first year here at the CTC. And as I started to move my children into preschool and uh, you know, care and school, um, I always knew teachers were important. I know still that by name, the teachers who were important in my life. Uh, but when you bring your children to school, and you're going to leave them in somebody else's care, uh, there's nothing more important, nothing more heart-wrenching than to get a wrong connection, a bad connection for your child. It doesn't take long for that to change your child's self-image, their, their knowledge about what they can do and be in the world. Uh, and so for me, this work became very mission-driven as I sent my children and then thought about other people's children and how critical it is for us to get the right educators with the right dispositions and the right beliefs about what children can do and their commitment to make it happen. I love the quote uh, that if children don't learn the way you teach, teach the way they learn. That's been, a, that's been for me, <laughs> a, a calling card for good teachers understand that their work is adaptive and they must adapt it to the people and the human beings that are in their care. Uh, and that's what we've been doing here. Um, the, you were doing it here before I got here, uh, but for 25 years of my work, and I did have an interlude where I went back to higher education, but coming back here has been uh, truly, truly one of the best things I could have ever done. And it's that mission to make sure we get the very best um, that we can, the very best preparation for the very best people to, to be in the schools with our children. And I, I'm confident that we are doing that and that every time we're together, we're looking for where's the edge of that 
And how do we keep pushing that edge and sharpening that edge? So I thank you for your, your, your feedback um, and, and for the amazing support that each of you provide to me and the feedback you provide about all of the work that we're doing, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, um, and I thank you for this evaluation. It's, it really is a pleasure and an honor to, to work with you. So thank you, Madam Chair. To get back to my script. <laughs> okay. Oh, item two E is the executive director report. Would you like to say <laughs> anything else, Dr. Sandy? Uh, new gear. Um, so, first of all, I am thrilled to welcome Commissioner Uzoff in person to our commission meeting. Um, she joined our, our, the commission at the last meeting, but was unable to be here in person. And so, uh, so now you're in the room and it's wonderful to have you here. Really looking forward to, uh, to your participation in everything we're doing. Um, secondly, I'd like to introduce a new member of our Professional Services Division staff, Jasmine Nasser. Our, I don't, Jasmine, please, hello, welcome. Um, Jasmine Nasser has worked in the education field in a variety of roles. She served as a first grade teacher and curriculum planner in New Orleans, Louisiana, and worked as an education researcher supporting studies related to school choice and teacher evaluation in New York City. She's also worked for different education nonprofits in California, designing, managing, and implementing education programming. Most recently, Jasmine worked as a consultant in BDOs, and I don't know what BDO stands for, but that's okay. We'll ask you later. Um, in BDOs, nonprofit and grant maker advisory practice. Uh, providing, an, pro providing advising and technical assistance services to nonprofit and philanthropic organizations. Jasmine earned her bachelor's degree in community development and education from the University of California, Davis, and a master's degree in sociology of education and education policy from New York University. Jasmine is joining our grants team in the professional services division, working with Kara Mendoza and David Gagir, and we welcome you to the commission Thank you for being here, so welcome. So uh, the last thing I, I would like to re report is that this is our last meeting in this building. And if, some, if, if anybody over there, <laughs> right? Have any of you read your text from me saying, what's the name of our new building? Okay, you guys are making me look bad now because I know Lee is in the name, but I can't remember the first name. May Lee, thank you. We're moving to the May Lee office complex over on the corner of 7th and Richards Boulevard. It's a new campus of state buildings. There are four state buildings there uh, and it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful space. Our building will be on the fifth floor and there, while there is a light rail, we're not gonna hear the railroad tracks and our building's not gonna tremble when the trains go by and we'll miss that. There's a, you know, there's something romantic about a train, right? Um, the leaf blowers, so you, there'll be a distant, distant thing. Um, and so, so this move is occurring in the month of May, and we'll have our June meeting in the May Lee office complex. Um, it will be a different experience for all of us. Um, I remember moving into this building. I've already confessed how long I've been here. And I remember when we moved from a funky little building on 9th and R uh, with a downstairs basement that never had the sun shine in it. Um, you remember that? Does Rhonda Brown remember that? Okay, good to have some people who remember this, feeling distinctly old today. But, um, but we moved from that little building to this big building and many, many important things have happened in this room and in this work uh, since we've been here. So, um, so we're moving into a slightly, it's gonna feel more corporate over there. Uh, when we did a tour a few weeks ago, someone said it's like Ikea. We're like, in, you know, all new desks and they all look the same. You know, everybody's got the same chair. So I mean, it's going to be really, that'll be different uh, for us because we're pretty eclectic here. We fit right into Midtown in this building. But um, so that'll be a little different for all of us. And um, we look forward to welcoming all of you, commissioners and our uh, commission community uh, into that new space at our June commission meeting. But um, I don't know, it's with mixed feelings that we that we're going to walk out of this building for the last time. So that concludes my report, Madam Chair. Thank you, Exec Executive Director Sandy. 
Um, do any commissioners have items to report? Commissioner Klatt. Good morning. Um, in the spirit of hope that, that our chair brought up, um, I was able to attend the Educating for Careers conference in March, and I was there with educators from 340 of the funded partnership academies in the state of California, and um, it was it was inspiring to be with so many educators coming around to help innovate um, the integration of, of career technical education with core academic classes. Um, I was fortunate to get to help found a partnership academy about, well, it's in the year 2000, so it's been a little bit. And um, I get to currently work in our partnership academy at our school. And for those who don't know, the partnership academy um, model is one that um, funds essentially a school within a school in a high school. It's a three-year program for um, that, that targets um, at Promise students to um, learn about and get, get real um, technical skills um, that they can enter college and career, but focusing really on um, career certification so that they can um, be inspired to work in, in the world outside. And it's really been one of the highlights of my teaching career is, is been able to um, participate to help to help build this academy and to continue to work in it and see just some of the amazing things it does for students. So I bring that up just because I know at some point in the in the current or in the following year we will talk again about career technical education and credentialing. Um, how, how do we we um, create those bridges between um, single subject? credential teachers and career technical education teachers. And the Partnership Academy model has been going for 40 years. And so it's just a great resource to look at some of the really innovative things that educators have done to create those bridges. So um, I was glad to go and I encourage anyone who doesn't know about California Partnership Academy model, you can look it up in CDE or come talk to me and I'd be happy to, to share my experiences with it. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Klatt, for sharing the good news and for your leadership with the Partnership Academies. Thank you. Um, any other commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Brown. I'm surprised that I'm always having something to say about early childhood education. Um, and thank you for talking about career tech education because one of the things that the community colleges are working on now, not as a system, but as individual colleges, is an early childhood apprenticeship program um, that really brings people into the workforce and um, education uh, teacher preparation at the same time. Um, what I wanted to mention is how exciting it is that we have an early childhood education focus, and we do this morning, so I won't go into um, detail about that, except to say that the process that the uh, commission staff has established is remarkable. It's remarkably inclusive, which means it's a little messy, it's incredibly democratic, um, and there's a level of public engagement that has been, um, that, that's, that's really, really something. Um, so I, I, just, I, I just think it really serves as a model of how this commission over the years I've been here has really brought in more and more of the public interests and vote and, and sort of that, that voice that I think is really important. On the community college uh, front, um, early Childhood Education and Child Development has a system-wide group called the Curriculum Alignment Project that has pulled together for years um, the kind of co foundational coursework um, to prepare teachers in the workforce. Um, and it's also working to align that work now with the Early Childhood Education TPEs here, which is fabulous. Um, and the two work groups that I've been uh, part of um, have been um, uh, an investigation of credit for prior learning, what, not just what knowledge is needed, but what experience is needed and how that can be connected. And also what right now is sort of called extended learning, because as school age includes, as public schools include TK and school age programs include TK, um, that really needs to be looked at as sort of a, an Again, extended learning and needs extended knowledge. So the, the look of, at school age, at infant toddler, at special ed, 
at um, dual language learners and at equity um, is in that work group scope, which I think is gonna be really interesting. And then finally, um, I'm really excited to go down to the um, California State Early Childhood Conference um, and, and be with um, the CTC staff. We have two sessions, one about the PDK credential and one about the child development uh, teaching permit work group. So that's exciting to be a participant there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Um, I see our colleagues on Zoom. So we'll start with Commissioner Cotton and then Pavre and then Francois, please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome from Zoom land. <laughs> um, I do want to, in the spirit of spring, I'm I'm loving the weather. The sun um, is just renewing and, and, and brings life, brings lots of weeds as well, but it brings lots of life too. <laughs> I've been driving through neighborhoods and just looking at how much growth there is. Um, and it is inspiring. So I'm excited about that. Um, I do want to give a few updates from the California Department of Education. Uh, each, each meeting we've been updating you on national board. And so I'd like to continue that. Um, the, the California National Board for the Professional Teaching Standards Certification Incentive Program is designed to grow and retain National Board certified teachers in high priority schools. Um, to date, the total number of subsidy teachers, so those who are in the process of getting their National Board certification, are 3,420. I think that's wonderful. Um, the total number of incentive teachers in both cohort one and two are 2,124. As of March, 2024, an, est an estimated 2024 teachers, um, 413 new incentive uh, folks that are coming in, and it could go up to 476. We're still in the midst of uh, vetting those, those applicants. Um, and then we also have the maintenance of the certification program. And so far we've had 251 participants in that. I do wanna acknowledge that this year we do find ourselves in a, a down budget season. Um, and the legislature may be looking to sweep those national board funds. CDE staff has proposed that the program be funded on an ongoing basis of $10 million per year. And we're hoping that this proposal will be considered as a program has made incredible progress in providing the most prepared teachers to our highest needs students in California. And so we wanna to continue to just lift up this program. Um, it has come and gone in the past and we would love to, to continue it and keep it as an ongoing piece of work. Um, I do wanna remind you that to address the um, identified persistent teacher shortage in our schools, uh, the Golden State Teacher Grant Program is one of, of, of several initiated initiatives that were created. Um, the Golden State Teacher Grant Program provides $20,000 to students in professional preparation programs. Um, the number of awardees uh, for 2023-24 is 8,952, equating to over $148 million supporting our, our educators coming into um, the profession. That is exciting work. I want to continue to lift that work up as well. I think it's also an, an, an excellent um, example of the work that we're doing to promote this through CDE, through um, the Student Aid Commission, and through higher ed. Um, across the board, it's serving our, ultimately serving our students. Um, I do want to remind folks that the California Assessment Conference is coming in October, October 15th, and those conference registrations will be open soon. Uh, the, this year's theme is empowering educators, leveraging assessment data and tools for classroom success. And so we really look forward to folks joining us for the California Assessment Conference. We're also gearing up for our California Distinguished School Awards um, coming in May. That is always a wonderful opportunity to, to celebrate and lift up our, our classrooms. Uh, yesterday, um, we hosted our the apprenticeship summit uh, at the Building and Trades uh, in San Francisco. I'm sorry, in Sacramento, and I it was such an engaging conversation with young people who are in these programs, as well as folks from higher ed, folks from um, trades, and in education um, that are looking at and building up apprenticeship programs. 
So just excited to, to share that work. Someone described uh, the apprenticeship program as CTE on steroids, that it's allowing folks to learn, but also to be paid, um, paid a wage while they're learning. And I think that that's very important, particularly for our young people who are just getting started. Um, finally, I just want to lift up that this is, we are in the midst of legislative season um, and we are advocating for programs, um, maintaining our programs, but also for continued growth, particularly in the area of statewide professional development in the areas of literacy and math. And so just uh, be aware, be aware and, and don't hesitate to communicate with your legislators about um, those bills and the work that we want to continue and the work that we want to uh, initiate this year. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Pabri. Good morning, everyone. Happy spring. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be with you all in person, especially now that this is the last uh, meeting at the this commission building. Uh, we're going to miss that place. Um, I wanted to share two quick updates uh, from the CSU. Um, and one is around our, our ongoing and longstanding and continued focus on academic preparation. Uh, with the with the in strong partnership with our PK twelve partners to ensure that all of our young people in the state have equitable opportunities to to attend college to attend the UC and the CSU uh, if they choose to do so. So the CSU has been hosting math summits across the state um, for high school teachers, counselors, school leaders to partner with us to learn more about CSU's programs and policies for high school students to prepare them um, to be eligible for the CSU and to be successful in the CSU. Our faculty uh, in partnership with high school teachers have designed six math bridge courses that are offered typically for 12th graders but could be taken by um, other high school students as well. Uh, they're free for districts to adopt uh, and also have accompanying professional learning. So it was wonderful to have the support of the College Futures Foundation to help us get 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 more um, information out and work closely with our uh, PK twelve partners in this area. I also Kate talked about earlier about uh, the PK three credential. We're really excited. Many of our programs are gearing up to um, launch their programs starting this fall, and uh, we will be holding our second uh, PK three convening tomorrow, uh, targeting on early numeracy. So we will have our CSU campuses along with their community college and school district partners joining us uh, to share best practices in teaching and learning around early numeracy and STEM uh, with a particular focus on working with multilingual learners. And again, our thanks to the Silver Giving and Easing Simons Foundation to support that work. So thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Francois. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you on Zoom. I'm sorry I can't be there with you today. I actually don't have a report today, um, but I did want to build on Chair Grinnell Shire's um, comments earlier about the vibrancy of spring and the optim optimism in the sense of renewal that um, spring springs. I and over 15,000 of our colleagues across the across the country and indeed across the world gathered last week at the American Educational Research Association's annual meeting in Philadelphia. And the theme of the annual meeting this year was dismantling racial injustice and constructing educational possibilities, a call to action. And spring reminds me, this was this is a fitting theme for spring because of the call to action around possibilities and centering all of our work acknowledging, yes, that it, much of our work springs from a response to injustice, but our work should be centered in justice. And I think that, that, it, that this meeting this year really, that theme resonated with me. The other thing that really resonated with me was that yes, absolutely, some of the best researchers and evaluation or evaluators in the field were there as they always are. Um, some are our, our, our most strong advocates for educator preparation, development, and support, being equity focused and justice minded were there. But this was the first time in the 20 plus years that I've been going to AERA 
where I saw so many classroom teachers presenting on their practice. I saw teams of classroom teachers and school counselors together sharing their practice. I saw teacher educators alongside mentor teachers sharing their practice. And the most encouraging thing that I saw was the number of sessions where researchers or clinical practitioners and their teachers brought K-12 students to speak on behalf of the research practice and policy that was happening at their school and how that touched their lives, how they were actually engaged in the process of re research, practice, and policy. Um, and I think that was the other theme that resonated in the conference was that of student voice. And I just want to give a shout out to the organizers. I wanna give a shout out to Dr. Tyrone Howard, who was the executive president of AERA, who kept saying during the planning process, this has to be about the K-12 students. Yes, it's the adults that serve them that will be the primary speakers. And I think, but we have to make sure that we center student voice. And as I walk the halls of Philadelphia Convention Center, the energy that those young people brought to that space was, it was just vibrating. I vibrated higher as a result of leaving that space. And I was also reminded, and I want to remind all of us, that it was those young people it was those K-12 students that make the work that we do so important. And so I just wanted to share that. And I wanted to thank all of us around this table and our colleagues for making classroom spaces vibrant and optimistic spaces of teaching and learning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner White-Smith and then Commissioner Davis. Good morning, colleagues and friends. Um, as you know, I represent the um, AICCU, um, our independent private not-for-profit um, colleges and universities. And um, as usual, I, I love to talk about our, our offering our services and our support as a partner in uh, doing exactly what um, and, uh, Commissioner Francois mentioned, uh, centering our students, centering justice, centering equity. Um, I want to call attention to a new brief that was just put out by the Learning Policy Institute. Um, it was released this month, and it highlighted um, best practices for our residency programs in the state of California. And just to highlight um, uh, Alder Graduate School of Education and um, also uh, Claremont Graduate School of Edu uh, Claremont Graduate University's teacher residency programs were touted in the in the um, in the report. Um, and um, so I invite you all to read it. There's going to be um, a follow up report to this. Um, and Alder graduate school right now um, in their enrollment has over 500 residents um, as part of their enrollment. So we're really trying to do our part to be a part of the solution and, and, and focusing um, on our, our students and our teachers. I also want to call attention um, to some other highlights from our sector. Um, the University of Laverne over the last um, I would say five years, has been rethinking uh, the way that they teach uh, reading and literacy practices. And one of the things that they started uh, right before um, the pandemic was engaging with the International Multisensory Structured Language Education Council in order to find a more appropriate approach to working with students who experience dyslexia and other um, disabilities that are similar to that. And the multisensory structured approach um, also uh, supports um, structured literacy, but it's based on the Orton-Gilliam model. Um, which has strong multisensory components to engage literacy, reading, speaking, drawing, 3D, songs, sounds. So a more holistic approach to the, um, to the, the teaching and learning of literacy strategies. 
It includes one-on-one -on -one tutoring, it includes direct instruction, but it also includes whole group instruction and it, it, it includes a holistic approach and understanding what specific needs um, the students have as opposed to a one-size-fits-all model for literacy instruction. And I want to commend my colleagues at the University of Laverne for taking the time to think through different models and adopting one that supports the diversity of our students and not a one size fits all model. I also would like to take the moment um, to, uh, to share some free resources for our colleagues in the field. Um, at the University of San Diego, um, we have a program that we offer every summer that is free to teachers called the Johnson's Fellow Program. And it is a program that support, that helps teachers um, think through anti-ableist um, teaching to center students with disabilities and to uh, provide for better, better supports um, in thinking about um, our students with disabilities in our classrooms. And so uh, participating in this also allows um, a $400 stipend to help support uh, getting um, uh, books and tools that you need in your own classrooms. So uh, I want to share that with all of you. I also would like to share that we are hosting um, an event uh, called Neurodiversity and Disability at the University of San Diego on May 6 from 5 to 7 for anybody who is interested in learning more about disability, disability studies, and neurodiversity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Davis. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Spring has indeed sprung. I have 58 rose bushes at home and I sneeze every time I go in <laughs> and out of my house. Um, I, I wanted to start off with uh, a, a welcome to our newest staff member. We appreciate, well, she's not here right now, but appreciate um, your service to the commission. And also um, wanted to say welcome to Commissioner Uzoff. And I haven't gotten a chance to to say hi, but I will try to make my way around the table at lunchtime today. Um, also want to say congratulations to Executive Director Sandy for such a sparkling review. We knew you can do it, and I know you've had a variety of successes lately, but this one is one that is nearest and dearest to my heart. I appreciate your service to the commission as well. Um, I wanted to also say congratulations to our student liaison here who had been admitted to a variety of graduate schools and hopefully he will mention them in his remarks in a moment, <laughs> but in case he doesn't just, you know, know that that's happening and he hasn't made a decision yet. So I also wanted to say thank you to Ms. Brown and Ms. Theriel back there, our supporting team here at, at the commission for of these meetings. They are just more than just support at a meeting. I've, I've been able to talk to them about a variety of things and see them outside of these commission meetings. They're just wonderful people. So if you get a chance to say thank you to Rhonda and Haiju today, please do so. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to Commissioner Klatt, who has been serving as a WASC accreditor for a while, and she was happened to be in my area doing um, an accreditation uh, on, a, an, on a visiting team while my high school also was um, having a visit from a different team. So, and then her friend who is on my visiting team, it was just kind of a small world thing. So um, appreciate your service in that regard. And some sad news. Um, one of um, our national board ambassadors, um, her name is Lori Solis. Um, she was a California Advocacy Program fellow um, through national board, passed away the other day. And she supported thousands and thousands of folks through the national board process here in California. And she is one of the staunchest advocates for the process. And she and I have done a couple of presentations together um, through our CTA channels and also 
um, through UCLA Summer Institute through C CTA as well. And she will be deeply, deeply missed. So um, her services um, will be announced at some point in the near future. Just really sad to hear about that one. Um, sorry. Um, let's see. Oh, also, I wanted to say thank you to Commissioner Cotton, um, who um, gave a lot of great information about and spotlighting the funding for in our field, especially about the National Board Incentive Grants. I understand that that funding may either um, sunset and not be renewed or swept, the funding um, for that. And there are so many teachers who are benefiting from um, having that funding and that incentive to become National Board Certified Teachers and is really re-energizing a lot of uh, folks who are a little later in the career or are it kind of in the middle of the career too. Um, I don't think that there are very many programs out there to keep people sustained in the field. We're often talking about new teachers, the teacher supply, but we're not often talking about how to keep those of us who have been working in the field for 30 years in the field, right? And encouraging us not to retire early or retire in general when we still have energy left and we want to put forth our best effort in a classroom. So um, I'm hoping that does not happen. And final thing here, I want to say um, uh, the National Board Turn-In Day, uh, the deadline is May 17th. And I want to say good luck to all of those folks out there who are completing portfolios. I know we have some folks sitting out in the audience today who are doing that. And so um, if you do not have a support provider helping you with the process, not that it's necessary to do so, there are lots of Facebook and Instagram groups that will help you through that process. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Commissioner De La Torre. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I also wanted to speak to the National Board Certification, uh, show my appreciation to Commissioner Cotton for sharing that information and also my concern that the funding for um, the teachers at the high priority schools may sunset or be swept. Um, we just had our pinning ceremony last week in LAUSD. And so I have this data at my fingertips that I'd like to share. Um, this funding has been so instrumental in helping teachers achieve the highest level of certification in education. And in our district, California ranks third in the nation with the number of newly board certified teachers. And I think that has a lot to do with the availability of this funding for teachers who would not have pursued. Um, and as Commissioner Davis was stating, it also invigorates teachers at all ages to pursue. And we had a 27 year old teacher who certified and a 67 year old teacher who certified in our district. So showing you that teaching really is a profession where we are in it from beginning to end, we're always improving our craft. Uh, at 67 years old, she did not have to put herself through this rigorous ordeal, which is very harrowing and it's a lot of work. So those of us that are board certified know. Uh, so I'm really proud of all teachers who went through the process, uh, regardless of whether or not they certified, but for this 67 year old teacher who did not need to do this, um, it's very inspiring. I also would like to share that um, we started with one teacher in LAUSD back in 1994 and one sole board certified teacher. And she was the inspiration to have our union and our district negotiate the creation of the support network and the incentives in my district for board certified teachers, which include the 15% stipend. <clears throat> this class was the largest class ever of board certified teachers in the history of LAUSD's uh, program. We had 218 teachers who certified, biggest class ever. So I'm really proud of all those teachers who put themselves through this. And I think a lot of it is due to the funding that was available. In addition to it being a large class, it was also the most diverse. 66% of our board certified teachers in this class are teachers of color. So that's a great achievement, but I fear that the, if the funding is cut or swept away or sunsets, some of these teachers might not have this opportunity to achieve this and pursue national board. So I'm very, very concerned about that. Um, 
So just some of the things that I wanted to share, uh, really proud and excited, but also fearful for what might happen because I know that these opportunities uh, might not be there for all teachers. And one last thing is almost, it's 89% of our board certified teachers are at high priority schools. And all the research shows that board certified teachers have the most impact with students at those schools. So we are making a big difference with this uh, program. And I am hopeful that uh, we can see it continue. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner De La Torre. And thank you to Commissioner Davis as well for your advocacy and your passion for this program that is absolutely critical. And I share your concerns. Um, my gosh. It's okay. <laughs> I have to look at <laughs> my did. list. Thank you. Uh, so speaking of uh, financial assistance, um, I just want to share a little bit about our world where we've been going with uh, financial assistance. As you many of you have heard and read, um, financial aid has been a little bit disastrous, a little bit confusing for many of our students, um, especially many of our um, families, our mixed families. Uh, but I will say that we did get some promising news from the state of California, um, allowing a lot of our mixed families to also do the California Dream Act um, to be able to get that state and institutional aid. So for us, that was a, a, a win. Um, still a little confusion, but excited that there's um, going to be some support for our students. And so with that said, uh, this week really is a call to action for a lot of our school counselors to do this work. But we know that this work cannot just be done by school counselors. It has to be done by all educators um, to really help our students uh, and, and our families because of this confusion that has been created. So I ask and I plead with all educators, um, please uh, you know, connect with your students, connect with your family members, that they still have an opportunity to file for financial aid. Um, the deadline for the state of California is May 2nd, uh, but we can still to continue, continue to do this work. Um, and along with the teacher supply, um, I just want to share a little bit as far as like stories of people that want to come into education, because when we look at the uh, report later today, or when we look at the report of teacher supply, you know, it's a little disheartening, but there's a lot of people trying to come into the profession. So just recently, I had a student who graduated from UC Santa Cruz with two degrees, calls up and says, how can I become an elementary school teacher? Right? Let me start by being a sub. I want to get in there. Like, put me in coach. She wants to get in have a retired um, school counselor who could have left, gone on vacation, never come back. She saw that we had a need. Um, some of our school counselors um, were out for different reasons and she came back and is there supporting our students, supporting and our new staff, a lot of our new counselors. Um, and then this last one is, we talked about tragedy and optimism. We had a teacher who passed away a couple months ago at, at a school site and it was really hard for the students, for the families, for the staff, because she had been there for so, for so long. Um, but her loss also opened up another door. There was an after-school coordinator who saw a need for her students because she had a lot of those students in the after-school program, said, what can I do to help? So she went and got her substitute um, credential and has been in the classroom helping out students during the day and connecting them with them after school, doing that double duty, right? Again, just showing you how committed folks are and how they want to come in to help and support. Um, so with that said, I just wanna continue to remind everyone that um, hope should be the dream that compels you into action, right? And so we need to continue this work uh, with May being Mental Health Month. Just remember to take care of yourselves take care of each other. And if you need some ideas, I think uh, Commissioner Davis really led us with um, showing what you're grateful for, right? That's important. Um, also, maybe some positive affirmations for yourself that you got this. Um, and also start to have those conversations about mental health. I know it's scary. I know for, um, I know within my family, it was something that we never talked about. And for a lot of our students, it's something they don't talk about. So it might be necessary for someone to have those conversations. For all of you, I see you drinking water, stay hydrated. And most of all, take a break from your devices and from your technology when you can and just soak in that beautiful 
spring air and just enjoy people around you. Um, with that said, I just want to thank you all for being here and just appreciate all of you for this work that you do that we know is difficult, but it's also so rewarding. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cadenas. I want to remind us that we're almost at 1010. I, I hate to do that. Uh, Commissioner Heredia. Okay, there we go. So we allocated money for the residency program, I think with a focus on SPED. So I'm um, at least that's, I think that's the area. So I'm, I'm excited about that. That's one thing. Um, the second thing is, is that um, I just lost my notes. Okay, bullet points. Um, so the other thing is, is that I, am, I was fortunate enough to attend a lobbying event um, on back in Washington, D.C. last year. So, I mean, last year, last week, felt like um, last week. And so I just want to point out there was, so part of the advocacy was on the idea, the uh, um, Individuals with Disability um, Education Act, since we as Californians only get 64% of the total cost for, um, for our students. And, um, and so it, that's, we're trying to, there's um, legislation trying to work for a pathway so that we get more money because this is, it's a growing population of students. And then the second thing I'll just report real quickly um, is the, you know, we talk about trying to recruit teachers and retain them um, in our, our profession. Um, but what, what we don't talk about is the retirement. And currently right now, um, you know, there's the, the government pension offset, the GPO. So if you are a teacher and um, you retire and your significant other is in a system where they get the social security, um, then the penalty is usually applied against the penalty for spousal benefits of that social security. So, you know, it just means, it seems like it just gets a little more complex sometimes um, in terms of retention. So that's just something I kind of want to share with everybody to think about that because um, right now, the superintendent in my district, she, um, that would apply to her, um, you know, and, and her position. So something to be, keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commissioners before we move to liaisons? Any liaisons have anything to report? Liaison. All right. I'll try to keep this quick. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm really excited to be back with you guys all and reconnect. Um, just some personal updates as Commissioner Davis kind of hinted at. Um, next Saturday, I'll actually be graduating um, with my degree in political. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so with my degree in political science, um, certificate in conflict management, and of course, my multi-subject teaching credential. Um, I'm finishing up my placement, finish the NTPA and RECA, so you guys know all the things we have to jump through. Um, so all that is done, amen. And I'm excited to get that credential. Um, also, I've been fortunate to receive three admissions authors um, for a master's in education policy, um, one program at UC Berkeley, a program at Columbia University Teachers College and the University College London's Institute of Education, um, where I'm an alternate finalist as a Fulbright scholar. So right now, <laughs> thank you guys. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm still currently laying out all my options, um, trying to finish up graduation, just a lot of things at this season, which I'm sure you guys are all very familiar with. Um, I'm currently, yeah, so after, after graduation, I'll actually be spending two months in Argentina, completing my final Spanish class requirement and staying with a homestay family in Buenos Aires. Um, so it's bittersweet, I won't be here for the first meeting in the um, new building, but I'll definitely be back in August and hopefully be able to join via Zoom. Um, yeah, I'm really, it's really bittersweet to leave Pepperdine and my students and my MT. You definitely grow a tight connection with them doing this full-time placement, but I am really excited to see what's to come after graduation. Um, moving on to our agenda, I'll, I want to follow up with the previous discussion I had um, last time about the student um, liaison portal or webpage. So I drafted a letter to um, the IT department outlining the purpose and hopefully like a proposed structure for the portal or the webpage. Um, so if someone could direct me to the appropriate like, IT department or who I can contact, um, that'll be really helpful just so we can get like the wheels moving on this project. Um, I don't want it to like end off before I leave out here. Maybe the next student liaison can follow up on it. Um, so yeah, that'll be extremely helpful. 
I'd also, I also like to take a moment to update you guys on a project I've been working on that I believe will greatly benefit um, the future student liaisons as well with the CTC. So I'm developing like a CTC student liaison orientation manual. I think this initiative will really help them give them clearance and guidance on when they enter the um, CTC just with balancing all the different things with full-time student teaching and um, just joining commission as a student. I think there's a lot of things that will really help them out. Um, so I would like to cover like essential topics such as how to balance the schedule, um, strategies for preparing effectively for the meetings, techniques to, of summarizing the agenda um, and submitted public comments, as well as of course just practical and fun information like the best places to stay and like things to do in Sacramento. I think that'll be really helpful um, to pass along to the next CTC members. Um, I'll move right along. Lastly, um, I'd also like to ask for your guys' consideration as we prepare for the next upcoming budget cycle. Um, that we can explore the possibility of establishing a partnership with community-based organizations to offer stipends for student teachers for their full-time placements. Um, teaming up with other programs could possibly provide um, the funding needed for the student teachers to receive stipends for their full-time phase. Um, the support would ease financial burdens on aspiring educators during their um, training period, ensuring they could focus on their education and becoming effective teachers. As someone who just went through this whole process, um, of course, like the financial barrier was definitely there um, and not only just for myself. I know like other friends who are going through the program. Um, so if we can like start thinking of different programs, whether it is working with CBOs or um, how we can allocate our funding to support these student teachers throughout their full time, I think that would be really, really helpful. And yeah, that concludes my reports. Thank you, guys. Well, thank you. And congratulations. We'll be very eager to hear who's lucky enough to have you for the next part of your professional journey. And thank you for your great ideas. Both executive director Sandy and I were writing down um, about your question regarding uh, the portal. And so uh, staff will follow up with you. So thank you very much. All right, colleagues, I'm gonna call it. Oh, oh hi, Dad. I'm sorry. Uh, Lazan Rodriguez, please. Yes, good morning. Um, I'm very excited about all of our uh, NBCTs and that we are uh, third in the country. This is great news. Um, thank you everyone for all your reports this morning. And I wish I were there with you in person, uh, especially to say goodbye to the building, which uh, um, is uh, has a very special place in my heart. Uh, so in March, the board um, reviewed CDE's proposed accountability work plan, which included the addition of science assessment data to the California State Dashboard. Uh, this has been a long time coming and is critical to elevating the visibility and awareness of the California Science Test and the California Alternate Assessment for Science. So several decision points will come before the board in 24-25 to further this work. Um, the dashboard will also have... Uh, uh, have two additional student populations to address across its indicators, uh, TK and long-term uh, English learners. TK data is being collected this year for the first time. LTELs will be included pursuant SB 141 and are defined as students who have not attained English language proficiency within seven years of initial classification as an English learner. Uh, at the end of 23-24 school year, uh, CDE will be collecting data on how many students have earned the civic seal of engagement. This will allow CDE to analyze the data and learn more about students earning the seal and bring this information to the SB in 25, 2025. Uh, this data collection is part of the CDE's broader effort to add components beyond graduation rate to the college and career indicator. CDE is also collecting data on internships, student-led enterprise, simulated work-based learning, or Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. Um, CD will also continue to solicit feedback on how industry certifications have been incorporated into the CD pathways around the state. Uh, and a little reference to uh, Commissioner Klatt's work on the academies, also very, very important part of this. Uh, CD will also provide support um, to LEAs to enter their teacher data and develop and release reports on staff demographic experience and education data in DataQuest and publish the third year of teacher assignment monitoring outcomes data. Uh, the board also heard an update from the reading difficulties risk screener selection panel, which will select evidence-based, culturally, linguistically, and developmentally appropriate screener screeners 
for use by teachers in the early grades beginning 26, uh, 25, 26 elements and evaluation criteria. The work of the panel will be concluded by January, 2025. Finally, in May, the board will approve three community school implementation grants, which is very exciting as CD and SB seek to realize the vision of the whole child education. I'll share more about this item at our next meeting in the new building. And uh, also, um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge um, Executive Director Sandy on a wonderful evaluation. definitely well deserved. I have learned so much from you as an educator and as, as a model for our profession. So um, that concludes my. Thank you. All right, commissioners, I think we'll take a break and if you can be back here at about 1028. <laughs> All right, see you in a few. Thank you. I now recess the general session and move to the Educator Preparation Committee. Commissioner Cardenas, will you please convene the committee? Good morning. I would like to call the April 2024 meeting of the Educator Preparation Committee to order. We have five agenda items. Two of these items are scheduled for today. The remaining three items are scheduled for tomorrow. The first item for today is item 3A, Child Development Permit Workgroup Update. This item is being presented by Renee Marshall, Deborah Keeler, and Bronwyn Kennedy. This is an information item. Ms. Marshall, will you please begin? Good morning, commissioners. It is great to be together today. I hope everybody is well. My name is Renee Marshall, and I serve as an administrator here at the commission. An agenda item presented to the commission in February 2024 provided information about the progress of the child development permit work group, also called the CDP work group. This agenda item presents an update of the CDP work group's ongoing progress towards making recommendations to the commission about the structure and requirements of the child development permits that are in alignment with workforce development goal two of the state's master plan for early learning and care and current needs in the field. The background section of this agenda item was shared at the Ve February commission meeting and covers the history of the child development permit matrix, including references to the master plan for early learning and care and the ECE teaching performance expectations. I will now hand it over to Debbie Keeler to share the questions that the child development permit work group continues to focus on. Thank you, Renee. The child development permit work group focuses on the following questions. Question one, how should the current permit structure be revised, updated, and or modified to ensure that early childhood educators are adequately prepared to meet the educational and developmental needs of children, their job roles, and the needs of employers considering the recommendations outlined in the master plan? Question two, how can the state best monitor and ensure quality in preparation of the ECE workforce within the resources available? Question three, how should the TPEs be reorganized to align with the proposed new structure for the child development permit? The child development permit work group has held six of eight scheduled meetings beginning in August, 2023. Please note that an additional eighth meeting has been added. Meeting dates and topics are provided in table one below, excuse me, uh, which is on page uh, 3A-2 of this item. Um, excuse me, and the Child Development Permit Work Group is facilitated with support from West Ed's RC, uh, Regional 15 Comprehensive, Comprehensive Center. I wanna call attention to the table and specifically um, call everyone's attention to the upcoming meetings. We have the April 30th meeting that's coming up from nine to four in just a few weeks. And there's quite a few topics on the table that will be covered um, during that virtual meeting. And we also have our concluding meeting of the Child Development Permit Work Group that is due to happen on June 12th, 2024 from nine to four. And that meeting will also be virtual. And we have included um, all the different items, uh, topics that will be happening at that meeting. Um, it's important for everybody to know though, the work group um, will be landing on recommendations within the next two meetings. Um, we would also like to call attention to the work group meeting summaries that are listed within this agenda item. The CDP work group summaries describe the ongoing overall work since August of 2023 and the general topics of discussion. 
Meeting links to these summaries are available for meetings one through four. So we have meeting links one through four there, and we have a placeholder for meeting link five once that summary becomes available from um, the Regional Comprehensive Center. And I will pass it over. The CDP workgroup's fifth meeting encompassed a comprehensive review of permit level data, building upon the discussions of the previous meeting, as well as an examination of recent data collected from focus groups and surveys conducted within the field pertinent to the overall permit structure. Much of the meeting was dedicated to reviewing the structure of the two new matri model matrices, delving into specific permit elements, such as authorizations, specialized coursework requirements, and renewal requirements. Work group members collaborated in small groups to focus on each level of the permit structure. Notably, meeting five also featured presentations on the needs of infants, toddlers, multilingual learners, promoting the formation of two ad hoc committees discussing these needed areas. These committees convened between the fifth and sixth meetings to identify any additional elements that could be incorporated into the permit structure to meet children's individualized needs and any recommendations the CDP workgroup should consider. During the sixth CDP workgroup meeting, a roadmap was presented in Appendix C that provides a thorough examination of permit level data, building upon the insights from meeting five, alongside recent field connections data. The matrices document underwent review, incorporating feedback from the previous meeting and a presentation containing recommendations from the infant, toddler, and multilingual learner ad hoc committees that met. Presentations on special education and expanded learning were shared with the recommendation that two additional ad hoc committees be formed for special education and expanded learning to meet between meeting six and meeting seven. The Child Development Associate presentation summarized specific elements of the CDA and the role of the CDA plays within the current child development permit structure, as well as considerations for the CDP workgroup in developing recommendations for revisions in light of the current workforce demands and programs tied to the CDA. The California Formative Teaching Performance Assessment, CalFTPA work was reviewed, along with the Early Childhood Education Teaching Performance Expectations approved by the Commission in 2019 to assist in the workgroup's discussion. Given the significant developments in the field since 2019, including the Master Plan for Early Learning and Care and ongoing revisions under consideration by the CDP workgroup, attention was directed towards the potential necessity of reorganizing and defining more clearly the teaching performance expectations to ensure alignment with the Early Learning Foundations currently being updated by the California Department of Education, as well as the PK-3 ECE Specialist Instruction Credentials, new TPEs, and the evolving needs of the current workforce. The CDP workgroup has two remaining scheduled meetings slated for April 30th and June 12th to delve into these topics that were outlined in Table 1. The ECE permit matrices and considerations include the work of the CDP workgroup in their diligent review of the existing CDP matrices alongside proposed changes stemming from the 2015 through 2017 ECE permit advisory panels efforts. Acknowledging shifts in the field since 2017 include the master plan for early learning and care document and the current workforce landscape. The diverse ECE workgroup members have approached these discussions with profound knowledge, comprehension, and fervent commitment to this endeavor. The earlier workgroup sessions laid the groundwork for these deliberations with each subsequent meeting building upon the previous ones to ensure a thorough understanding of the issues and needs surrounding the permit structure. Early discussions have included renaming the permit levels to diverge from the current descriptions spurred by the workgroup feedback, along, although this remains under consideration. One proposal involves merging the assistant teacher level with the associate teacher level to establish an entry-level pathway on the permit ladder. This pathway would require completion of 12 units in early childhood education, focusing on core courses, laying the foundation for the knowledge, skills, and dispositions necessary for working in a supportive role within the classroom. 
In an endeavor to elevate the professionalism of early childhood education field, the work group is presently deliberating the possibility of implementing an associate's degree as the minimum requirement for the teacher level of the permit. The work group's polling results align with this proposition, reflecting consensus consistent with the findings from field survey polls conducted thus far. Noteworthy concerns have been raised regarding the transition from the current 24 unit in early childhood and 16 general education requirement units to the attainment of an associate's degree or an AA degree or associate's arts degree for transfer and AAT, promoting discussions on strategies to support the field in adapting to this shift. Regarding the master teacher level, ongoing discussions are focusing on aligning the requirements with a Bachelor's of Arts degree and 24 units in early childhood education. This alignment aims to facilitate a pathway into a PK-3 credentialing program and also to prepare individuals for roles as mentors or coaches for teachers and assistant teacher levels. As for the site supervisor and program director levels, the work group is exploring the possibility of maintaining these two permit permits as distinctive categories or merging them or streamlining them in the permit structure. The decision to retain separate categories is influenced by the field's demand for a single site permit option for those serving as teaching directors um, as the graduated level qualifications needed for those um, being able to oversee multiple sites or multiple programs um, at the program director level. The progressive level of competencies outlined in the Master Plan for Early Learning and Care are detailed in a chart found in Appendix D, which delineates each permit level along with the initial current considerations. The matrix has served as a foundational reference for discussions initiated by the work group during meetings four and five. Feedback from meeting six, which offers a more comprehensive perspective on the permit levels, is currently under analysis by the CDP work group. The more detailed versions of the presentation, meeting seven, up in June. Initiated in meeting two, discussions on aligning the teacher pro teaching performance expectations with the competencies outlined in the state's master plan have progressed. Meeting six further delved into defining more clearly and potentially restructuring the TPEs to ensure alignment with the PK3 ECE specialist instruction credential and the plan. An ad hoc committee will closely examine group's considerations and delve deeper into these matters, reporting out to the work group during meeting seven. As the work group has navigated through meeting materials and associated considerations, several issues have surfaced for general consideration. Although not directly solicited by the work group's charge, it is crucial to acknowledge these associated issues with the permit structure discussion. These issues include accessibility and affordability of additional coursework, opportunities for professional development, wage considerations for early childhood education jobs, and future accessibility to educational grants that would provide financial assistance. In March 2024, three focus groups were conducted and a survey was distributed to the field, resulted in 503 responses from members of the early childhood community. The respondents comprising classroom teachers, classroom support staff, administrators, family child care owners, and other partners in the early childhood sector participated in both the focus groups and the survey. They were presented with five standardized poll, poll questions and five open-ended questions for feedback. The focus groups and surveys were designed to collect similar data and the findings are summarized. The current permit structure in early childhood education supports obtaining a higher educator, education and educators are informed about steps they need to take to advance their career path. It allows educators to enter the workforce through a variety of pathways and offers options for those with or without a degree. Overall, the structure is working well for some programs, but there are concerns about verification of experience and the complexities of the renewal process. The permit structure needs to be simplified and made more flexible with clearer guidelines and opportunities for renewal. Suggestions include the need for more bilingual staff, equitable and inclusive pathways to obtaining permits, aligning community care licensing requirements, state funded program requirements, and emphasizing responsive and sustainable cultural and linguistic practices. 
simplifying the application process, extending permit renewal time limits, recognizing ECE work experience, and including components for diverse teacher candidates were additional considerations identified by the ECE field that were surveyed. For more detailed review of the gathered poll data, please refer to Appendix E. For next steps, the staff will implement the CDP workgroup plan as affirmed by the commission and provide its next update on the work at a commission meeting during summer 2024. We would also like to express appreciation for everyone who is engaged in and about the child development permit work group. Special thanks to everyone who submitted letters about the child, uh, excuse me, about the CDP workgroup agenda item, including Kidango, ESEPS, Early Edge, California Together, California Now. Um, we appreciate all the different items that you have brought forth. You are in the meeting now. Recording in progress. Colleagues, can I please have your attention? Um, given our technical difficulties, I am going to adjourn the meeting right now, and then we are going to reconvene at 1130. So meeting is adjourned. General session is adjourned. Ed, Ed prep committee is adjourned. So our colleagues on uh, Zoom, we're going to reconvene at 1130. I'll see you in a few. We don't need to log out, do we? You you do not need to read to log out. You just need to know that the meeting is adjourned until 1130 when uh, the chair gavels it back in. Okay, thank you. My understanding from council is that it needs to be adjourned based on the um, the internet failure, and she, and we will we'll get the whole clarity uh, shortly. And at eleven thirty, we will do what we're required by government code to do. So this is going to push back our lunch time just a little bit. So if you need a snack, get it now. I now re uh, <laughs> reconvene the general session. I'm now going to close the general session and we're going to move to the Educator Preparation Committee. Welcome back to the educa Educator Preparation Committee meeting. And I just want to say thank you very much for the presentation. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, and I know, Renee, you were finishing up at the very end. I didn't know if there's anything else that you wanted to say at the, at the, at the last part. I was just going to share that the ECE team is available for any questions or comments, and we appreciate the commissioner's engagement. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, at this time, I would now like to open for public comment. If there are members of the public that would like to make a comment, please notify the meeting moderator by submitting a request card or by clicking on the raise hand icon if participating through Zoom or pressing star nine if participating by phone. Now I'm gonna wait a little bit because I know that we are getting back online. Okay, recording secretary, are there any public comments? Yes, uh, Regina Chagoya, please um, approach the microphone and share your comment. Yes, hi, um, my name is Regina Chagoya. I'm with the um, California Federation of Teachers, um, subbing for Steve McDougal. <laughs> um, CFT agrees by and large with the concerns and suggestions um, brought forth by ESEPs, uh, Children Now, Kidango, California's Together, and Early Edge. Uh, please take these suggestions into consideration while continuing the work with the child development permitting process. Thank you.
Maeva Mark, please approach the microphone and share your comment. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Maeva Mark. I'm the VP of Advocacy and Policy with Cadengo. And we really appreciate the work being done to enhance the multiple career pathways for educators. Um, as an organization who serves 5,000 children and families throughout our child care development centers, we have been deeply impacted by the teacher shortage crisis for our workforce. And so in order to ensure continuity of care for children and keeping classrooms open, we urge you to consider the proposed emergency certification for individuals to serve as associate teachers while pursuing the required 12 units. Um, we also urge you to not remove the CDA Child Development Associate credential, which is an equitable alternative pathway to um, enter the workforce, the child care workforce. Um, additionally, we urge you to continue to um, work through creating career pathways that build the capacity of programs to have the strongest and most accessible models possible for the inclusion of children with disabilities, dual language learners, immigrants, Black, Latinx, Indigenous children, and all children who have been harmed by systemic racism, oppression, exclusion, and economic inequities. Lastly, we also urge you to um, ensure that the ECE workforce has access to free and or affordable professional development opportunities that promote culturally and linguistically affirming care and education. Thank you so much. Melanie Cottrell, please unmute your microphone and share your comment. Good morning, Melanie Cottrell, Executive Director, Head Start California. We are the nonprofit association representing the 160 Head Start programs, serving 95,000 children throughout California. And I am also a liaison to the work group. We appreciate the commission's attention and all of staff's dedication to improving the permit matrix and would like to echo the concerns of our colleagues and comments regarding ensuring that equity is built in with alternative pathways to reach credentials and that we are mindful of the impact of increasing education requirements through the permit matrix without commensurate increases in salary. We are concerned that increasing education- Recording in progress will negatively impact our workforce unless they are supported financially and through time in getting those additional units that would be required. Thank you. Montessorita, please unmute your microphone and share your comment. Hi, I'm Emma Johnston. I am sorry, my um, Zoom account is my business. So um, I'm Emma Johnston, not Montessorita. Um, and I am a board member of the California Montessori Alliance. And I'm also a um, owner of a teacher education program that is MACD accredited for Montessori early childhood education. And I'm here to make comment regarding the um, agenda item 3A and also the goal two of the CTC where we have prospective educators um, should have multiple pathways to explore and access careers in education. So I think we all agree that highly qualified and prepared teachers are an essential component of a high quality early childhood environment and sharing in that goal that we should have multiple pathways. Um, we want to bring to the attention of the commission the qualified Montessori educators that currently are in the field and entering the field. 
um, and make sure that they have a pathway to be able to teach in these environments moving forward. Uh, in Montessori, a highly qualified early childhood education teacher is one with a Montessori credential from an accredited institution. Montessori teacher preparation covers the same topics found in bachelors in early childhood education, including child development, instructional methods, social emotional learning, culturally responsive uh, teaching, differentiated instruction, lesson planning, etc. Um, our credential programs also include a practicum and requirement for continuing education which I know is something that has been discussed in the work group meeting as well. Um, Montessori uh, teacher education programs adhere to detailed standards put in place by national associations like MACD, the Montessori Accreditation Council for Teacher Education, which is recognized by the U.S. Department of Education. So although it's important to ensure qualifications, it is also critical to be inclusive of committed ed educators who have not taken a traditional path and who are beginning a second or third career. To give the state's preschool children access to Montessori education, individuals with a bachelor's degree in any subject area and a Montessori credentialed issued by AMS, AMI or MACD accredited should be included in the ECE 1, 2, and 3. So thank you for your time. I appreciate you all. Thanks. Johnson, uh, Tony Jordan. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Tony Jordan, Executive Director of Child and Family Services Division at the Stanislaus County Office of Education. Uh, thank the uh, permit work group and the uh, commission for their active engagement and making improvements to the child development permit matrix, which is a blueprint for uh, the work that we do, educating 9,300 children, supporting 7,200 families, and uh, employing over 1,200 early education professionals across an eight-county region, along with our 12 partner agencies. Uh, we do this work in about 168 classes uh, within 78 early childhood education centers across that territory. Uh, we also directly contract with over 100 uh, family child care providers. Uh, certainly appreciate uh, the continuation of having a 12 unit entry point and having the CDA credential continue to uh, exist as one of those pathways in. Um, I would like to uh, voice that uh, Assembly Bill 1930 currently underway to remove the 10 year limitation of the associate teacher permit is uh, another positive uh, movement in, in the right direction for our field. Uh, the, the concern I have that I think the commission needs to be aware of is by removing the 24 unit teacher permit from the career ladder, essentially takes the rung out of the career ladder. And that is uh, going to be a devastating and detrimental impact to uh, the services and programs that we operate. So I would highly uh, encourage you to consider not removing the 24 uh, unit teacher permit as part of the uh, revamping of the child development permit matrix. It serves us well in the field. Thank you. Please make your comment. Yeah. Hi, I'm here. Uh, my name is Melanie Brown, and I'm a longtime public Montessori teacher who runs an accredited teacher education program. The program specializes in preparing teachers for the public arena and uses innovative approaches that enable our graduates to be agile in their approaches to 21st century education. Many of our adult learners are duly enrolled in programs that meet both the requirements of the state and Montessori, and they report that many of the topics are covered in both programs. Furthermore, both programs have a practicum phase. The Montessori practicum phase includes demonstrating roughly 40 essential skills to demonstrate for certification. 
Many adult learners are additionally reporting a feeling of burnout due to the duplicacy, duplicacy efforts and a financial burden. I'm worried that this will lead to this path only being available to those privileged folks who have both the time and money for the dual program. It would be in the best interest of our students and teachers for Montessori teacher education preparation programs to be recognized by the California CTC. Eddie Loomis. Good morning. Um, my name is Julie Lemus, and I work with the Stanislaus County Office of Education. We offer um, Head Start, Early Head Start, General Child Care, and State Preschool um, around actually various counties. I, I did want to speak and say how much how important having different pathways into ECE are to our field and to the stability of our field. Um, we all know here, I'm sure, that the first five years of life are the most critical years and having staff that is not only well educated but well supported in their journeys is very important. Here we are very happy about the changes with associate teacher permit um, being more sustainable because we have seen many staff leave the field with um, those expiring. Um, we feel very strongly that is important not to, to re, not require an associate's degree um, at the 24 unit um, teacher permit level. We think that's a very important level for people as they um, have their go through their educational journey. And taking that rung as a ladder is um, would be a, a big mistake for for the stability of our um, entire workforce. Thank you. Hi there, thank you so much. My name is Camilla Rand. I'm calling from Early Care and Education Pathways to Success. ESEP's mission is to advance the rigorous professional development and economic well being of those who teach, nurture, and support young children and families. And I first just want to thank the Permit Work Group and the Commission for this very transparent process. It has been um, very collaborative and transparent, and I just want to make that known. Um, so I am um, making comments today to ensure that the Commission consider maintaining the CDA as an alternative pathway to the associate teacher permit. The CDA is the most widely recognized and utilized credential for early educators in the United States. California has long granted reciprocity for ECE professionals with this certification by establishing its equivalency to the Child Development Associate Teacher Permit. Earning the CDA ensures equity across systems by providing diverse learners and non-traditional students with alternative pathways to meeting the requirements for these programs. Research has also demonstrated that traditional college pathways do not necessarily nor easily work for many groups represented by our workforce in, here in California. And this does not mean that lowering standards, qualities, or expectations is what I am asking. It means that providing options, ensuring access, and guaranteeing an equitable system of ECE professional development. The CDA allows aspiring and incumbent workers greater flexibility, more autonomy, and the ability to earn an associate teacher permit more quickly. So this is really the time more than ever when we need to be providing options and flexibility to support and build our workforce, not providing barriers that lead to people continuing to leave the field. Thank you. We do not have any more public comments. Just going to give it a second. 
Okay, the public comment period for this item is now closed. Do the commissioners have any questions or comments on this item? Commissioner Brown? I wanted to give everyone else a chance because I'm all, I always have something to say on this. First of all, can you tell how inclusive this really has been? Um, and I also appreciate the public comments, both um, in person t in today um, and also um, the written comments. I think the other piece to really try to, try to keep clarifying is um, what the commission's role is in preparing teachers and also what the role isn't about paying teacher salaries. Um, but at the same time, we want to work with other agencies who can really help support this workforce um, in its preparation as well as in its work. But we do have limited responsibilities on that part. Um, but I'm really excited to keep this going. Executive Director Sandy. Yeah, I just really want to thank um, staff for bringing this item and for the work that you've been leading for us uh, in the field and for the very inclusive way in which you've done that. Um, this is an important inflection point in the development of this kind of work. It gives us the opportunity to give you the check-in you'll need because this will be coming back to you uh, possibly as early as August with recommendations for adoption. And what we heard from the field and appreciate having on the record uh, are the, the ways in which the field expects this to land in their context, the opportunities and the tensions that are reflected there. Uh, and what we are not hearing yet is complete unanimity. And that's because our field is very complex and we know this. Uh, and making sure that we land something that is achievable and aspirational and aligned with the state master plan. All of these things are critical goals that the goals live simultaneously, but getting to all of them uh, means that, that the panel is going to need to do some work on uh, kind of prioritizing and analyzing and making a case for the recommendations they bring to you. And then you'll have the opportunity to make uh, the decisions about how this permit should be structured going forward. So thank you for the time and thank you for uh, everyone's flexibility while we had the internet outage. Um, item straddled that, that, that moment, but we straddled it well and just kept rolling. So thank you. Commissioner Davis. Uh, just a brief comment. I just wanted to say thank you uh, to Ms. Marshall, Ms. Keeler, and Ms. Kennedy for this work. And um, I, while I haven't been integrally involved in the entire, you know, process of going to the meetings and everything that, you know, through Commissioner Brown, um, she and I have made a presentation about the permit and thank you all for preparing that presentation for us uh, it, because it, it really did make a difference with it. Uh, a new crop of uh, teacher candidates who are also in a doctorate program who are uh, aspiring to be uh, leaders um, in um, our, our California classrooms that they were aware um, at the forefront of the planning of this document so they can see the iterations and the development of this permit and then also the other aspects, these little tiny things that um, Executive Director Sandy just mentioned to us about the nuances that go in because you have so many players, so many constituents involved in this process and it's very complex and I feel very assured that you three are at the helm representing us there. Um, from the Commission's perspective. So thank you very much. I appreciate your help. Commissioner Heredia. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you to staff who prepared this. Um, I think these things are complex. I'm just trying to get it prepared for us um, to make sure that we have this understanding of what um, and what is how it how it has um, you know evolved. Um, I just want to support um, it seems like uh, these are like my own thoughts, but also supported by um, the public comments about the um, performance of the dual language learners um, when it says that, you know, 60% of the kids in California, I believe, um, 
Yeah, with the 60% of California children age birth to five being dual language learners. Um, really paying attention to that and looking at what kind of coursework then that will prepare them to address um, the dual language learners. I visited a, um, a, a school recently that's, you know, TK um, and, and and, you know, as we move on to, to include more kids at that, at that age, um, two things, you know, I'm looking, I am now look at watching um, how this district grapples with um, the students who are identified with, um, you know, who, who are in need, have some needs that fall in the category of special education, but also those that, um, you know, come in already with two languages or maybe just one language and the instructional assistance in terms of their preparation of working with these children. So there's a lot of work to be done. It's, I think we're still struggling to make sure that the instructional assistants have that preparation. It's one thing to know how to work with children, but it's the other thing is, is the pedagogy that you use and, and the science and research behind why you're making those choices, which is so critical other than I think this might work. Or it's worked in my, you know, in my house with, you know, with the abuelita working with the kids or having a daycare center. We just, you know, we've got to keep pushing for that knowledge of why do we make the, why do we make that decision? But um, I don't. This this particular population of students, um, I think, is just one that we all have a critical eye towards because it's growing immensely. So um, again, I support. The, um, some of the recommendations that have been in these letters, um, looking even at the six units of, you know, preparation of courses that will specialize in that. We we ask for um, units in our teaching credential program, um, and I don't believe there's any reason why we shouldn't ask for those same type of um, credential, I mean, units in, in this program, you know, working towards this permit also, um, because those are the early years before they get to, you know, the early are the you know lower elementary grades. Thank you. I think I see uh, Commissioner Cotton, your hand raised. Yes, thank you. I just wanted just to, to thank the um, commission staff on this work and to the team that is is repeatedly coming back to this conversation. They are methodically kind of moving through and creating policy that's going to make a difference. Um, I do just want to keep highlighting the need for, you know, keeping in mind on pathways. So how does this support folks who are interested in child development, want to move into early ed, or those folks who want to move into and have a clear pathway to um, becoming a certificated teacher, either with the pre-K-3 credential or multiple subject credential or a single subject credential, but keeping pathways in mind. But um, uh, kudos to the staff um, for that consistent work that they're doing and to um, the team or the committee that's, that's doing this work. Thank you. Not seeing any other commissioners. Oh, student liaison Wicks. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I just had a quick question about like the additional units. If we're requiring like an additional six units for the associates, and I think I might have heard um, for the bachelor's degree, it's, it's also an additional like 24 units. Are there, I know like at least in LA back home, we have like the LA Promise, I think is what it's called, where like community college courses are free for students to like take whatever courses they need at the community college level. I was wondering if there's something implemented for, like would that be possible for students who have to go back and take the additional courses? Um, just trying to relieve that financial burden that could be placed upon students to receive this permit. Um, I am not sure if there's anybody on commission staff who is more of a promise expert. Um, I know pro I know the promise program through the community college system from my previous um, job when I was in the community college system, not from my commission position. So before I respond, is there anybody who can respond directly on promise? Okay, um, I hope I respond to this one correctly. And if not, I can circle back with you. The Promise program is traditionally for high school students that are going to their direct connect on their community college. So I don't know if at this point it can be opened in another space, um, but we have Commissioner Brown who's here who might be able to um, 
um, to reflect on this or possibly help to make connections uh, for that to be a possibility. When we're talking about the units that are in relationship to the permit, sometimes you have people who already have a degree and are going to work on a child development permit, but you often have people who are who start off with a child development permit that eventually will lead to more of like a certificate on the program that they're in that eventually leads to an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. And so um, not always, but often permits are kind of... Um, um, in a space that people will, that's, and this is actually why we refer to the matrix as both a ladder and a lattice, because people will use the matrix, the permit matrix, like a ladder to other positions in terms of like education attainment, certificates, degrees, you know, moving into a leadership position. But we also want to really emphasize that the, the child development permit matrix also needs to be a lattice. Because as it was referenced by some, some of the public that made comments, there are in people who are employed that want to stay in their position for the duration of their career without taking additional units or without um, having to go back for additional certification. And so the intention of the permit matrix is that it would be a ladder for those who want to utilize it as a ladder, but it could also be a lattice. But in terms of those additional units um, for a, like other funding sources, um, at this time, I don't believe Promise could be utilized for that. Um, but that doesn't mean there isn't a, another another mechanism that's not, um, you know, um, at the forefront of my thought here. I hope I'm sorry that wasn't a great response. Um, um, a little 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 response on that one. Bronwyn or Debbie, would you like to add to that at all? Yeah, I'd like to mention that through the planning council, the early childhood planning councils, there are, are additional stipends for those that want to go on and take additional units. And those are available on a yearly basis. And that is funding that comes um, to the planning council from the state. So there is definitely opportunity and, and many of those in the field have taken advantage of that funding. Debbie, I really appreciate you mentioning that because I forgot to mention the Child Development Training Consortium, which is a, uh, um, a resource that community college students who are currently enrolled in early childhood education coursework while they are employed at the at the end of their semester after they have successfully passed those classes, um, Child Development Training Consortium will support them by providing a stipend to pay for a portion of the cost of their units from that semester. So that is another resource that community college students will often tap into. But as far as I know, I believe CDTC mm -hmm. is exclusively for community college students. Bronwyn, was there anything that you wanted to add? No, just piggybacking on what Debbie said, there are usually different um, workforce development grants through um, the County Office of Ed that will support these. The, you know, we have the uh, Quality Counts workforce, to, workforce Pathway Grant that comes out every year um, that goes in line with the, the planning council. Those will always help attain higher education for any candidate that wants to either work on their permit or um, additional units. Those are always great things to, to look at with your county office of eds or um, resource and referral offices. Thank you so much, Bronwyn. I appreciate it. Financial issues are always something that our ECE team is looking at, um, both from just our, our team's experience going through the system ourselves, in addition to what we know um, is a burden and a barrier for some um, in the field of ECE. So please know that we are always talking about um, the financial piece of it. Thank you, everyone. I think uh, Commissioner Brown's going to add really quick. Hi, Renee. <laughs> Hi, Debbie. <laughs> Hi, I, um, Bronwyn. I, I just wanted to add um, to those resources that the College Promise Program at the community college system is primarily for full-time students. Um, a, a few of the districts are trying to expand it to part-time students, but since 70 to 75% of our community college students are part-time, that's a big, big lift. So it, it's focused primarily on full-time students. That doesn't mean it doesn't matter, but um, the other thing is that um, one of the community college districts got a pilot program passed through the assembly, um, an assembly bill pro, uh, pilot program to offer free tuition to all of those district residents, all of them, if they were committed to a certificate or a degree. 
that has been incredibly successful at that district. So the hope is that that pilot program now will interest other districts in looking at this free tuition, which if you're as old as I am, which a few of you are, you know that community college used to be free um, to all of the, its residents. And that would make it really helpful because the course, coursework that we're talking about, as well as the clinical practice, could all be, and therefore, affordable both for workforce development, but also for those who want to go beyond and use it as a ladder. Thank you, Commissioner Brown, for mentioning that. I also want to just mention that the community college system has a huge initiative for online educational resources. And so the past concern about textbook costs that, I mean, I remember when they'd be 600 to 1,000 per semester, fortunately in many pathways, um, and especially in early childhood education, they the community college system has developed substantial online um, educational resources. And there are some colleges that have pathways in early childhood education that are 100% online textbooks with no textbook costs. So we're very lucky in early childhood education that they like were first out the gate in terms of the community college system and creating online educational resources. And that has benefited those in our field who are utilizing the community college system for their early childhood education training. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Well, this is a information item, so no action is needed at this time. Um, just want to say thank you to Ms. Marshall, Ms. Killer, and Ms. Kennedy, um, and also thank you to everybody who provided public comment. Um, this is really necessary in this work as we move forward. Um, thank you very much. So our last Educator Preparation Committee item for today is item 3B, the update on California Early Childhood Education Formative Teaching Performance Assessment. This item is being presented by Amy Rising, Phyllis Jacobson, and Brownman Kennedy. This is an information item. Ms. Rising, will you please begin? I, okay, I'll start again. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, Dr. Jacobson and I and Bronwyn online are happy to present this item to you. And with that, I will turn it to my colleague, Dr. Jacobson, to begin. Good afternoon, commissioners. This agenda item provides an update on the progress of the California Early Childhood Education Formative Teaching Performance Assessment, here and after will be referred to as the Cal FTPA. Um, this work relates to the child development permit, the theme of the morning here, specifically the performance expectations for the job role of a child development teacher in an early childhood setting, for example, a state preschool setting or another ECE setting that requires teachers to hold a child development teacher level permit. We've been working for several years now towards a competency-based system for preparation and licensure for the child development permit, as is called for in the state's 2020 master plan for early lear learning and care. As part of that transition, performance expectations focusing on the job roles relating to working with young children in an ECE setting were adopted by the commission in 2019, following extensive field and public review of these draft TPEs for all of the six levels of the current permit. The Commission also adopted at the same time a set of program guidelines that provide quality expectations for those post-secondary CDP preparation programs. Following adoption of the early childhood TPEs, the California Community College's Curriculum Alignment Project, or CAP, which uh, Commissioner Brown kindly referenced in her remarks earlier this morning, worked to revise that curriculum to incorporate the TPEs to help facilitate the statewide implementation of the TPEs within the child development permit coursework and practicum classes. Also during the past three years, as these programmatic and curricular pieces were being put into place, the Commission received some federal funding from the state's Preschool Development Grant Renewal, or PDGR grant, to support the work to help post-secondary institutions transition to ECE TPE inclusive and program guidelines informed practices. 
One of these key pieces of work supported by the PDGR grant was the development of a formative ECE child development permit teaching performance assessment at the teacher level of the permit. The teacher level was felt to be the most appropriate place to develop this performance assessment since the teacher role is key within the permit structure. Commission staff with funding from the PDGR grant and advice and assistance from a design team of ECE experts as shown in Appendix A of the item, developed and validated the Cal FTPA over the past three years as an optional, formative, locally administered and locally scored performance assessment for post-secondary programs that prepare candidates for the teacher level CDP. And this was for them to embed within their program and practicum course requirements as appropriate to the design of each of these preparation programs. The Cal FTPA is being implemented as a formative teaching performance assessment for several reasons. Programs may choose to voluntarily embed and implement the Cal FTPA in lieu of other coursework assessments or in addition to other local assessments. The formative nature of the assessment allows for focused feedback to be provided to the teacher level candidates based on the performance ex expectations for their intended job role as they progress through the program. And at the same time, it provides information useful for program faculty and program administrators to reflect on, to identify modifications that might be needed to meet the candidate's professional learning and, and development goals. All of this work is consistent with the recommendations in the 2020 Master Plan for Early Learning and Care. And now Amy will explain more about the CalTPA development process, current implementation status, and followed by Bronwyn, who will address some next steps for this work. Thank you. Um, so I just want to begin this conversation with you by really underscoring the fact that this is very early in its implementation, and we uh, have had a few years together to work on this and work with the field on this, but we, again, this is very early in its implementation, and really the first time that we've gotten to be here at the table with you to talk about this. Uh, it's formative. We have not at all explored anything like what we would call a passing standard here because it really is exploratory in nature, formative, in other words, really intending to be professional development at this level in the field and kind of setting that experience up for how to support new teacher development and bring, as Phyllis mentioned, Dr. Jacobson mentioned, the TPEs kind of to life inside of our early childhood programs. And the commission, of course, wants to be there in partnership with everyone to really bring this work along. So that being said, um, we really do see this as professional development. And with that, I'll explain a bit about what this is starting to look like in, in its early first iteration and uh, steps, as Phyllis said of how we will continue to support the field and moving this professional development forward. So uh, you can see in your item that we had the chance to work with a design team of educators as we typically do in these kinds of assessment development efforts. And that is found in Appendix A. And I do wanna very much thank all of the educators that joined us for this work over the last several years. Um, we have quite a number of meetings. We meet <laughs> once a month for the first six months and then every other month after that or as needed. And it's voluntary work and it's uh, really appreciated for all those who gave us their time and expertise. But I also wanna point out that we had several liaisons working with us in, with this design team as well. And we had the uh, California Community College Chancellor's Office representation with us at most meetings. West Ed also often joined us as well as the California Department of Education so I just wanted to take a minute and really thank them uh, as well. And so with that, I'm going to walk you through uh, some of this early development work of what we have underway. So we have three cycles. The first one, we call them learning cycles. They have our traditional sort of four steps to them. So they bear the hallmarks of many of our other assessments. Um, and may be familiar to those of you who are familiar with those assessments. So we do have four steps in our first cycle. We're looking at, with our beginning teachers, how to observe young children in the early childhood setting, how we observe them, observe their knowledge, skills, and abilities, their interactions, their dispositions, and then um, work towards really taking that observation data 
and sharing it then with the teacher of record and talking through what those observations were. Are they typical for that child? Are they atypical? Uh, is there something new there? What are we seeing? Right. And then comparing that to other data we might have, because we always want to make sure we're looking at multiple sources of information before we think about how to best support a child. And then um, conducting a second observation. There's a reflection period then, as we always have, because all of our educators need to become reflective practitioners about what happened when they went through the observation experience. What did they learn? What happened when they shared that information with other educators? And what was that comparison back and forth? And then finally, um, what they would take forward and apply from what they've learned. So that's cycle one, how to observe young children. The second cycle focuses on planning learning activities for young children. So taking, again, from that observational stance what the students are students and children are ready to engage and experience. And then thinking uh, again with the support of a uh, classroom teacher of record, what would be developmentally appropriate for these children? And thinking particularly about that in regards to how to create a safe and positive learning environment for the children you're serving, how you engage them in active learning, hands-on manipulatives, et cetera, as you engage with them, um, toys and play, of course, and checking for understanding finally, and if needed, adopting in that moment to the needs of the children you're working with. These are things that we would look for in this activity, and we do ask in this um, learning cycle for video of that work. We do not ask for that in cycle one. And then finally, again, stepping back, reflecting on that video with, again, a supervising teacher thinking about the activity, thinking about how it best served those children, engage those children actively in learning and experience, and then thinking about what you might do differently in that application stage for a next activity. That brings us to our third activity, which is a very exciting moment for us because this is the first time we have pulled in this idea that really we need to help our beginning teachers learn how to uh, communicate with families and guardians who are taking care of uh, our youngest learners. So cycle three, you can see, again, has its four steps. We again start with that observation of children and their learning, um, observation of either the classroom teacher teaching or that beginning teacher if they're ready to teach through that activity. And then taking that step of identifying a focused child and their family guardian situation, understanding about that, and um, thinking about how to then connect the learning in the, in the early childhood setting to things that might be happening with that child outside of school, um, and then building that kind of activity. And so that's one component to this learning cycle, the other is really helping our new teachers learn to build those partnerships with families and guardians. So there are three opportunities to hopefully interact with that family and or guardian set of folks and uh, the back and forth between this is what we're doing in the classroom and how your, your child experienced that. Here, here is an activity you might try outside of school and then connecting to find out how that went. And then, of course, reflecting on all of that, and of course, our final step of then applying what you've learned about those interactions and how you might take that forward in supporting the ongoing learning and experiences for the, that child inside of school in that learning setting and then outside of school. That is our third uh, learning cycle that we co-developed with our early childhood experts. So I do want to take a moment and talk about how this uh, set of professional development materials is planned to be used around scoring and looking at that evidence that we would ask the beginning teacher to pull together within each of those three learning cycles. So uh, our analytic rubrics, we call them, always have attached what we call an essential question. And that essential question really sets up for the assessor and those looking at that evidence with hopefully that beginning teacher, what the focus is. And so we have five rubrics in this first uh, um, cycle that we pro provide for you on page seven and the actual uh, essential questions for each of those five rubrics. And then what happens in our rubrics, and you can see this displayed for you on page eight, they have three levels of described practice. And we always work with our assessors and we will be working with those in the field who will be implementing this if they choose locally, that you would always start with your essential question. 
So you have your body of evidence, you remind yourself of the essential question and focus, and then you always start at level two. And you start at level two and come through and see what evidence you can look at to make the score judgment, and you walk through what is expected at the level two um, proficiency, and then you make that determination. And as you go on through this item, you see we explain that process by saying, Within a level, we have things we call constructs, so there are different things that we're looking for evidence about. And to stay at the level two, you would have to have evidence for every construct in level two. And if something is missing there, then you would consider whether then, of course, they drop down to a one. And if everything is there, then you would consider whether or not they are level three. Um, and so the way these rubrics were written, they were written in such a way that you could then meet. For example, if Phyllis was my beginning teacher, I would meet with her. We would look at the evidence together. We would look at the rubrics together. We would walk through those constructs and talk about what's there and what's not there yet and what then supports I might provide to Dr. Jacobson in improving her early childhood practice. So that is explained for you uh, in the item. So I want to go on and talk about how we got to these three cycles and these three level uh, scoring, qualitative scoring rubrics. We worked with our design team diligently, as I said, and they were very uh, engaged in the process and helpful to us. And we were able to pilot test these cycles uh, with a, quite a number of programs. And we actually had 78 teachers who engaged and participated and gave us back that evidence so we could look at it as with the design team. And we were able to train uh, in that first round of study 16 assessors who helped us then look at those returned sets of evidence. And we learned a lot from that experience and really did some very deep revision as we came from that first trial into the second. Uh, for example, in the first trial, in each of those cycles, uh, we had them dealing with three different focused children and we moved to one as we came into the second round in the field test, for example. We then did move into the field test in the spring of 23 uh, and 22 and then into the fall of 23 because we realized that the way our early childhood programs work wasn't really going to work for a spring field test, but they had candidates back with them in the fall. So we extended that uh, to try and be a responsive to program. And we were able to have uh, 54 students work with us in the field test and then trained about 19 additional and some assessors that came back from the pilot. And again, we studied all of that return deeply and revised and then were able um, to develop the final versions of what we call candidate assessment guides. We also developed a program faculty instructor guide and then uh, other resources and materials. And that's what I'm going to move into next. We were able to um, Develop, and that's for you on page 10, six in six modules of professional development. And then we began rolling that out. So in the fall, we were able to bring together early childhood educators um, at three different community colleges that were kind enough to let us on their campus and gave us space and supported us in providing these. So we began that work this fall um, in October at Consumness. River Community College here in the Sacramento area. We were able to work with um, the Merritt Community College in Oakland. And if you haven't been to that campus, I highly <laughs> encourage you to go. Extraordinarily beautiful. It sits on top of the Berkeley Hills and oversees the entire city of San Francisco. But a uh, lovely space to work in and we thank them for letting us come be with them there in Oakland. And then finally, uh, East Los Angeles Community College also welcomed us to their campus and we worked with teachers there. So across those three in-person um, professional opportunities where we could begin to really talk about this work with a wider uh, group of educators, um, we were able to work with about 58 of those folks in person and really get to know them and help them get to know us as commission folks and what this work was about. So again, we thank those community colleges very much for letting us come and be with them. And that was very, uh, very uh, instrumental because it also gave us the opportunity again for us as commission staff to really learn about the ways these programs are offered, the students who come into these programs and things that we needed to really be keeping in mind as we helped, um, you know, share the information about all of this work. So that brings us to the six modules that we uh, then backed up as staff to uh, make sure that we had all the professional development opportunity we could put out there uh, to programs 
for that kind of work. And again, um, I, earlier it was mentioned that, you know, the need to really focus on how do we help build all of this infrastructure and knowledge in a way that's free. And all of this, of course, was offered at no cost to everyone involved. And thank goodness for um, my colleague Phyllis, who's amazing at writing federal grants because we had dollars to support that work. So um, that brings us to the six modules. So our first module is an overall introductory module, sort of setting up the purpose and foundational knowledge for this work. What are those TPEs that we're looking at together through evidence that student teachers would pull together in, a, in their work with children? The second module is really important, and I do want to um, give a shout out to Dr. Terrell Sales, who worked with us. Um, he's a faculty member at Pe Pepperdine to build uh, off of what we had as an implicit bias training for all of our assessors and performance assessment work. But he came to join us a year or so ago and was able to actually pick up that work and really bring it up and uh, improve it. And the second module is uh, actually really dependent on a video recording of him really teaching this through so that everyone can use that out in the field. And I really want to thank him for joining us in this important work, really looking at cultural and linguistic assets that our children bring to us. And then as assessors, how we take our own bias and set that aside and really look at what's in front of us in the evidence base. Module three takes uh, you deeply into cycle one, how you would implement it, how you would look at that evidence and score it. Same with module four, now though looking at cycle two. Module five is looking at cycle three. And then finally, the sixth module really focuses on how if you're going to implement this locally in your own program, what are some key ideas and strategies and best practices for this type of assessment that gets offered in an embedded way with students in real early childhood settings with real children and uh, what you need to think about if you're going to be scoring it, how you keep those scores, how you provide score reports back, et cetera. So that is what module six is about. So uh, as I pointed out, we were able this fall to focus on module one, two, and six with those who joined us this spring. And um, this is where I'm gonna in a minute introduce Bronwyn. We are going to be able to offer online. Um, our federal grant ended in December, so we no longer have the advantage of our technical contractor with us or any additional dollars unless we can find some more, Phyllis. And so uh, we will be doing all of this with commission staff. And so uh, with that, I wanna introduce Bronwyn who will talk a little bit about next steps and what's coming, but we will be providing that in-depth professional development on modules three, four, and five around each of the three learning cycles. And so with that, Bronwyn, uh, thank you for hanging on and being with us uh, to take this next step because Bronwyn and Debbie and Renee, that our group of early childhood experts that we're so excited to have with us finally on our team here at the commission are gonna be picking up this important work and really providing uh, that in-depth support to the field. So Bronwyn. Thank you so much, Amy and Phyllis. The ECU team is excited to be part of Palace CPA in the exciting next steps of the implementation process, which will include continuing to provide professional development sessions to interested child development permit preparation programs and their faculty. We look forward to providing and expanding additional professional development opportunities for faculty interested in serving as scorers of the Palace CPA based on the six faculty training modules Amy mentioned. And staff will continue to refine program, faculty, and ECE student teacher training and support materials based on feedback from the field. Staff will also continue to provide technical assistance and support to the field as they begin to incorporate the Cal FCPA within coursework and practicum experience for ECE student teachers. This spring virtual professional development sessions focused on each of the three learning cycles will be provided by commission staff. These sessions will be held on May 3rd and May 10th and inform information regarding these virtual sessions are being provided in the PSD e-news as well as the ECE news update. I'll just add to what Bronwyn was offering. This will this professional development will continue on through the summer and into the fall and as we continue to sort of build uh, up the interest in this work, um, we'll be there to provide that support and all of the modules and materials that I spoke about today in this item will all be hosted on the commission's website. So soon when you go to the front page of the commission, there will be a new button called performance assessment. <laughs> and you can go there and then click through and get to all these materials that are all provided uh, for free to the field to use. And we'll be there to help with technical assistance. And with that, we wrap up the item. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, we will now open for public comment. If there are members of the public that would like to make a comment, please notify the meeting moderator by submitting a request card or by clicking on the raise hand icon if participating through Zoom or press star nine if participating by phone. Recording secretary, are there any public comments? Aaron Givens, please, please approach the microphone and share a comment. Okay, I can still never tell when it's on. Good morning, um, commissioners. My name is Erin Giddens. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I'm a fifth grade teacher in La Habra, and I'm representing the California Teachers Association. I would like to thank the commission staff for their work on this item. As we stated before, CTA is supportive of authentic performance assessments that are embedded within a program and used as part of multiple measures to support educators. I was eager to hear the work group wants to use this as a tool for professional development use. Um, so we were wondering what work is specifically being done to em embed this formative assessment into existing coursework that was referenced to be in module six so that um, programs have options with its layout because I think what comes to mind is if it sneaks up too fast, it's just gonna serve as the extra thing which may not be its intended use. It's also unclear from the language in the item if the commission intends to transition the Cal FTPA to a high stakes assessment that will serve as a barrier for educators in similar fashion as to the current uses of ED and Cal TPA. Clarification from the commission would be appreciated as the significant issues with high stakes TPAs have been highlighted for some time now and continues to be of great concern for CTA. Thank you guys so much. for public comment. The public comment period for this item is now closed. Do commissioners have any questions or comments on this item? Commissioner Whitesmith? Um, I just would like to uh, thank um, the committee for this extremely, I mean, I know it's beginning stages, but thoughtful and um, informative and um, uh, work. Um, I also want to commend um, the work on uh, implicit bias training and um, highlight uh, my colleague Terrell, Se Terrell Sells, um, who is an AICCU member for his work in helping lead that. And as a former uh, early childhood educator, I was a kindergarten teacher, um, a while ago, but a story that comes to mind that I always keep at the forefront of why this work is so important and how it is sometimes um, unintentional with regards to harm that we, we, um, we do to, to children. But I remember um, an African-American uh, kindergartner that was going to be held back um, a year uh, in the school that I was teaching because she didn't know her numbers and her colors and her shapes. Um, and so I asked how she was evaluated. How, how do you know that she doesn't? Because I saw her. She wasn't in my class, but I saw her every day. I knew she knew her colors. I knew she knew her shapes just from playing on the playground. And um, they said, because we gave her this assessment and she couldn't call it out, how did you do it? Well, we sat down with her and said, oh my gosh, could you help me with this? I don't know what these colors are. I don't know what these shapes are. Could you help me figure that out? And I said, as an African-American myself, my mother never spoke to me that way. We always uh, use things uh, you, as a utility to go and find things or to do things or to engage in work. I said, have you considered culture in your assessment? No, we did not. So I said, can I redo it? Brought the girl over. I said, you know what? Can you go over to the table and pick up um, the square piece and hand it to the boy with the red shirt? Could you go over to the black center? Could you pick up uh, you know, and did this until she demonstrated her knowledge? And the principal was so upset by this and said, why didn't you demonstrate your knowledge when your teacher asked you to? And she said, my mom told me to respect my elders and I didn't want her to feel bad because she didn't know her colors and her shapes. And so, so I, 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 
this is something that I feel is really important and precious because uh, things that we think are developmentally appropriate for that age group might not be culturally appropriate for the child. And so thank you so much for attending to this, to this really important piece. Chair Grimmishire. Just a shout out to Commissioner White Smith for um, identifying the power of performance assessments. Thank you. I see uh, Commissioner Francois. Yeah, that was awesome. Commissioner White Smith and such a wonderful reminder of how we have to ev be ever cognizant of implicit bias, the role that culture plays in what we know and how we know it and how we demonstrate our knowledge. So thank you so much for that. I also want to commend the staff for um, the consistency of the two first two cycles, cycle one and cycle two, with your pre the previous, well, let me rephrase that, the developmental consistency across cycle one and cycle two um, relative to the other TPAs that you that we've developed. <clears throat> And a real deep appreciation for cycle three. Um, it's it's so important that we as educators are good observers of children and that we are good partners with families um, and other caregivers. And so I'm excited to see how cycle three develops and is, is implemented and what we can learn around authentic, transformative family engagement through um, this, this performance assessment. I would also like to ask the staff to make a correction to the third table on Appendix A to include um, one design team member from the University of California system. I believe um, Helen Davis at UCLA was part of the design team and we're not included in that last table. We are a, we are a small but mighty segment. Thank you for pointing that out. I really appreciate that. And my apologies to Helen for leaving her off. She was uh, an incredible contributor to the discussions at every single meeting. So Helen, my apologies. Thank you. Oh, we put you in the wrong place. Is that what we did? What? I'm lost. Never mind. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> I'll figure it out. Make the correction. Commissioner Francois, was, was that it? Yes, just for clarity, Amy. I, now, I'm with you now. I'm table, with you. I see. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank, okay. you. Oh. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Commissioner Brown? This is pretty exciting, and um, I have to say, while I was listening, when I read this, and while I was listening to this, I'm sitting here writing myself notes of the courses I teach that we could include, even though the the courses that we build at the community colleges cannot require students to work directly with children in the community, and this is built on people that are already working with children in the community. It's a great base. For us to be able, I'm saying, oh, yeah, we could do that. Uh -huh, we could do that. Mm -hmm. So I think that this will be useful even when the performance assessments can't be implemented in a course that can't require people to work with, directly with children, but is introducing people to what the foundational knowledge is in order to do that well. So thank you. This is really exciting work. Yeah. yeah. You're welcome. Any other commissioners? I believe either Executive Director Sandy or Amy, did you want to respond to any of the questions that were posed? Yeah, I, I think it would be helpful, Amy, if you could talk about the process for embedding and working with faculty to embed this instrument and how we're going to roll that out. Mm -hmm. um, sure. So. Um, you can you can see in those different modules we kind of tried to piece it out because it's a lot to it's a lot to take on and that's what I meant by saying we're at the early stages of really helping our programs. I think you also heard Phyllis talk about uh, some of the other important work that happened under PDGR around piloting 
uh, even peer evaluation of program, et cetera. So there are many things in the early childhood teacher preparation space that we're working on simultaneously. One of them happens to be this formative professional development oriented performance assessment opportunity. So um, one of the things that we did when we were able to have time to work in person when programs came was we asked them to bring their course syllabi with them to our our workshops, our professional workshops, uh, development workshops in the fall. And we will continue to do that. But to really, um, what we would do then is ask the faculty that were with us, the instructors, other educators that came to those events to sit together and really look across their coursework and their opportunity for practicum and think about their policies at their campuses because some campuses in fact do have many of their early childhood uh, students in early childhood settings working and they're also taking courses and then some have actual practicum where they're um, asking their students to engage with our youngest learners in early childhood settings. There's just a few, a full array of wonderful different ways that we help our teachers get ready to teach. And so we had that, uh, that challenge of how do we build uh, these learning cycles to fit all these different uh, types of learning situations for our, our student teachers. So that's one way we did it is we really said, you know, bring your coursework. Let's look deeply. These need to be embedded. We don't want this laid on top of. It's too much and overwhelming. We'd like you to look at what you are asking, see how all that aligns. Maybe you're already using the CAP course alignment. Maybe you already have some of similar activities for your student teachers. What this does for you is provides, you know, a set of materials that are already developed for you. If you want to try them out and use them, it has these rubrics tied that you can use if you want kind of a consistent way to look across a group of students that you have. We know a lot of our community students move from one community set of experiences to another community college campus altogether. How do they take them? If we have common experiences across our programs, if you're moving around as a student, you should still get the same kind of experience and have the same kind of language and understanding what we're talking about, right? So we tried to think about all of that with our design team um, and really take that stance of let's observe the children and move forward then with their experiences. But um, those are some ways that we have worked with programs already to think about how to embed this and how they might use it, how they might put it across time. We would never want to do all of these things back to back. You would never want to ever leave student teachers to do these experiences by themselves, you know, all of that good teaching around what is an embedded performance assessment, how is it formative, how do you provide that feedback um, in that consistent way uh, for the growth. Um, I think the other thing that they got very interested in, the ones that we got to work with in the fall, was around how they could look at their program and think about how their program is aligned to other programs or how they might have this information coming back to them about what their students might really need from their programs to be best and ready, uh, best suited and ready to enter those teaching positions. So I think those we got to work with saw both of those outcomes. Uh, and we will continue to have the online outcome and Renee and Debbie uh, and Bronwyn will be there with their expertise as well to continue that dialogue. But it, it's always fascinating to bring uh, instructors together to talk about teaching practice and to look at it together because it really is great professional development. So, uh, you know, performance assessment of this nature, being formative, optional, free, let's try it out together and learn together is the approach that we're taking. So we're hoping uh, programs can be with us to grow and develop. Go ahead. If I could just add one more thing to that, you know, I, I recall that I think as long ago as maybe two years by now, we started having conversations with the CAP um, coursework people. I remember we were up here at the hotel and we were having a session on, let's think about assessment practices. And it was before we even started this work. And one of the things that we did specifically is to look at those common CAP courses and what assessments were already embedded in those courses and say, okay, well, maybe could we combine something that we're thinking about in terms of performance assessment in here? Would that work? How would that look? How might it play out? And so we've been having these very productive conversations with the, the CAP developers, and they in turn with their CAP users, to mm -hmm. talk about how these things could be embedded in a way that is not necessarily duplicative, but is supportive. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Executive Director Sandy. I'd just like to get back to the other question that our colleagues from CTA raised and appreciate 
the opportunity to talk about whether this is uh, going to be a high stakes assessment that you must pass in order to get a permit at some point in the future. And, and that's a question that is just a long way off in my opinion. Right now, what we do, uh, what somebody has to do to earn a child development pre permit is complete a number of units. Period. Mic drop. That's all. We don't set standards. Well, we have standards in place. We have performance expectations. We do not accredit in the community college coursework. We do not accredit programs leading to this permit. We piloted alongside the development of this. The PDGR grant was this wonderful opportunity for us to build an instrument that we thought would be of use to bring some common understanding and, and work uh, to the community colleges. But the community colleges where most of this, the work for the permit is, is underway, they've been collaborating around a common consistent approach for decades without much in the way of guidance or help from the commission. Um, they've been appreciative whenever we've adopted standards or guidelines or performance expectations, which the commission did for the child development permit back in 2019, was it? I'd look at Phyllis every time because I forget the years are a blur behind me here. But we built some performance expectations for the teacher and assisting and, um, and mentoring and leading components of getting a permit back in 2019 and dropped them into the field and said, what do you make of this? And the curriculum alignment project, the CAP project, which is a collaborative of faculty, uh, worked through those and said, how can we make sure that our courses, how can we develop common courses that are building these concepts in? How can we be anticipating and getting ahead of the commission, really? Because the commission is not working in that field the way we are in the rest of our credentialing fields. So, um, so we're at a stage now where we've got performance expectations. We've been working on this permit. We've, we've built the PK3 credential, which is subject to accreditation and a performance assessment. And, and, and we're bringing, uh, you know, more attention and more support to the community college system leading to the child development permit. But our approach at the moment is not to, you know, <laughs> drop in a whole accreditation you know, another 110 or 20 institutions that we accredit or, or drop the TPA or this formative TPA into a high stake space. This is really about us learning to communicate effectively with a sector that has been taking care of the preparation of this workforce for decades and to, to work, continue to work collaboratively about how do we get to some common understandings about what someone should need to know and be able to do if they're going to teach in this space, and that's what the permit work group is doing. The PDGR work has allowed us to really explore the funded work here, uh, what it would take for us to provide the kind of support that would be helpful and necessary. And this tool uh, was designed with that in mind, as a formative tool, as something that faculty could work with, so that we've got strong instruments, we hope, uh, that will get stronger with use. The more we put it in use, the more we'll learn about it, the more we'll adapt it to become the kind of strong, useful tool that it's intended to be. That's how we do TPA work and performance assessment work. Um, but with, with the goal being to have faculty working with this so they can build really strong preparation and teach us about uh, mm -hmm. how well this captures the kinds of practices you can capture and see uh, to support future teachers in preschool spaces. So um, all that to say, uh, there's not an in, a design at this point or in, intention at this point to turn this into uh, a, a, a requirement for earning a permit, but building it into the program uh, and working with faculty to do that uh, is where we're at right now. And I'm not saying that we will never get to a place where we think that's a good idea. That lies with you, commissioners, and with the legislature. But for now, making sure we've got really good professional development tools that we can work with and work with this community around uh, is the goal. I just want to say thank you for that. And um, this is really exciting. Um, just all the thoughtfulness that has been going around this. So thank you very much, staff. This is um, an information item. No action is needed at this time. Thank you again, Ms. Rising, Ms. Jacobson, and Ms. Kennedy, and also to all the comments. Oh, Anna Marie, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Francois.
Thank you. Um, wow, I really appreciate the insights from both Mary and Amy about the formative nature of this and how well it could be embedded into um, preparation and professional development long-term. And at the same time, it does bring me back to the TPAs that are already in existence and the questions that the CTA representative, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, um, brought up around those TPAs the high stakes nature of those TPAs and how they how that those TPAs sit in alignment with the with uh, a more multiple measures um, perspective on assessing a candidate's readiness to go into the field and I know that those two things have come up um, multiple times over multiple um, commission meetings and I'm just hoping that we can have more conversations about that because I think that. I'm not sure I, I'm not sure as a commissioner that I understand where we're landing as a collective on um, you know our views about multiple measures and high stakes testing, even if it's through a performance assessment. And I understand that we have some limitations on what we can do, um, but it does seem worthy of more intentional conversation. So I don't have a question. I just want to make that statement. Thank you, Commissioner Francois, but I see also student liaison Wicks. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to commend you guys with this um, item. I think it's really cool. I just wanted to highlight briefly cycle three, the building family and guardians partnerships. I know as a student teacher right now, that is one area when I have to sit in like IEP meetings and 504 plans and the parent conference, I was like, whoa, this is a new beast that I forgot I have to experience as a teacher. So I think having this within um, this performance task is really helpful. Um, and can like can really affect the early um, early childhood permit group. So I just wanted to highlight that and say thank you for including that. I'm gonna do one more scan of the room and also of Zoom. All right, I don't see anyone else. Um, I just want to end with this. I think as we're as we're learning, right, and, and uh, Executive Director Sandy continues to tell tell us when we know better, we can do better. So as we go through this process, we'll continue to adjust and adapt to the needs of our students and our candidates. So thank you. With that said, having no additional items today, I recess the Educator Preparation Committee until tomorrow. Thank you. Um, I wanna now recess the general session. Members of the commission will go into closed session. The general session will reconvene at 8.30 tomorrow morning. <laughs>